Good afternoon. I am Council Member Mark Traeger and Chair of the Education Committee. Uh, welcome to today's hearing on the proposed DOE uh, fiscal 2020-2024 five-year capital plan held jointly with the Committee on Finance and the Subcommittee on Capital. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Lorraine Grillo, President of the School Construction Authority, and Karen Goldmark, Deputy Chancellor for School Planning and Development at the Department of Education, who will be testifying on the capital plan. I would like to also thank uh, John Shea, Chief Executive Officer of the Division of School Facilities, for being here to answer questions. Uh, the proposed uh, plan totals $17 billion, a significant and welcome investment in the capital needs of the New York City school system. Over half of the plan's funding, $8.76 billion, is for new capacity. Another $5.17 billion is for capital improvements to existing school buildings, and $3.07 billion is allocated to mandated programs. On October 31st, right before this proposed capital plan was released, the Speaker, Chair Drum, Chair Gibson, and I sent a letter to the administration outlining our vision for the fiscal 2020-2024 five-year capital plan. Our letter discussed five major aspects of the school capital program, capacity, essential school projects, plan funding, transparency, and collaboration. I'd like to focus my opening remarks on essential school projects and transparency. The proposed capital plan allocates $2.42 billion to school enhancement projects, which includes many investments the Council has advocated for in the past. Science labs, bathroom upgrades, physical education, security cameras, air conditioning, and accessibility. However, the inclusion of these projects under the school enhancement category is a misnomer, reflective of the administration's narrow approach to funding this kind of capital work. The city must reset its baseline expectations for safe and supportive learning environments. The classification of basic school capital assets as enhancements in the capital plan should cease. Accessibility, physical education spaces, and air conditioning are school essentials not enhancements, and the capital plan should reflect this reality. The council is, is not picking on semantics or simply asking for the SEA to change the name of the school enhancement project section of the capital plan. We're asking for a meaningful policy change in the way these types of projects are funded and prioritized. The fiscal 2020-2024 capital plan should set specific quantifiable goals in these program areas and align spending with achieving those targets. The Council is not so naive as to think we could fund all these essential school pro components over the course of one five-year capital plan. However, this does not preclude setting long-term goals that can be accomplished with funding in future plans. Accessibility is a perfect example. The Council is thrilled to see an investment of $750 million in school accessibility projects and clear goals for this funding outlined with that, that announcement. However, we want to see the, these goals out codified in the capital plan and have a discussion about how funding and projects in this five-year period will move us toward a goal of a full school system accessibility. Technology is another good example of the need to reset our baseline expectations for school facilities. Laptops and computers are not luxuries. They are essentials, particularly in the 21st century. Yet access to these learning tools is not provided equally across city schools. The city council allocates approximately 40 to $50 million a year for school technology projects, but the administration should be ensuring all schools have the technology they need for 21st century instru instruction. The proposed plan includes $750 million for technology, and I hope that this proposed investment will move us closer towards ensuring our schools have the appropriate bandwidth. However, I continue to be concerned when I visit schools where student laptops go unused, smart boards are used to hold chart paper, and special education providers cannot log, log their services because of poor internet speeds and connections. One of my primary concerns as chair of the Education Committee has also been transparency. The SEA does publish a significant amount of information in the capital plan, as well as provide the council with supplementary data. However, I want to see the SEA and DOE launch a new effort to increase transparency. For years, the council has requested the capital plan in machine-readable format, a request that has gone unmet due to legacy systems. Publishing the capital plan in machine readable would not only 
uh, facilitate the council's oversight of school capital spending. It would likely also allow for more user-friendly public-facing information about planned and ongoing capital projects at the individual school level. Principals, teachers, and parents often have no idea what projects are planned for their school buildings in the five-year capital plan. They may see scaffolding go up around their school overnight without knowing what the project uh, is for. Capital plan information should be included on the DOE's webpage and on each school's webpage so that members of school communities can easily see ongoing and planned projects at their schools. The Council has a long history of working collaboratively with the SEA and DOE on school capital. I look forward to hearing your response to rethinking the approach for funding essential school projects and, rev and revising the presentation of the capital plan uh, to for, for further transparency. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't also highlight uh, funding for capacity, which is essential to help the city address school overcrowding and avoid future overcrowding. While the proposed plan includes a significant investment in new schools, the council remains frustrated by the lack of transparency, innovation, and efficiency in the school planning and siting process. Uh, Finance Chair Drum will delve further into this issue in his remarks. I'd like to thank the Finance Committee uh, and Education Committee staff for their work in preparing for today's hearing. Caitlin O'Hagan, Rebecca uh, uh, Chasen, uh, Noah Brick, Stephanie Ruiz, Liz Hoffman, Beth Golub, Jen Atwell, and Kalima Johnson. I'd like to thank also my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, and Eric Feinberg. And I'll now turn it over to my co-chair, the Finance Chair, Councilmember Daniel Drum. Thank you, Chair Traeger, and good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum, and I'm the chair of the Finance Committee. I would like to echo Chair Traeger in welcoming you to today's hearing and in thanking Lorraine Grillo, Karen Goldmark, and John Shea for being here to testify and answer questions about the proposed five-year school capital plan. Let's start with the good news. The proposed plan allocates $7.88 billion for the construction of 57,000 K-12 seats, an historic investment that will bring the total new K-12 seats constructed since the start of the last five-year plan to over 83,000 seats. This fulfills a commitment Mayor de Blasio made in 2017 to fully fund the identified seat need of the current 2015 to 19 plan by 2024. But even as the administration is taking a big leap forward with respect to funding the identified seat need of the current plan, we have questions with respect to identified seat need in the proposed new plan. The proposed plan seems to have removed any reference to a recalculated identified seat need for the new five-year period. According to the funding levels that the administration has included in the proposed plan, the identified seat need in 2024 remains at the exact same level as in 2019. Um, will seat need remain the same in five years? Moreover, while the overall 83,000 identified seat need remains unchanged, the locations where the proposed plan is funding K-12 seats differ from where the administration determined they were needed in the current plan. So for example, in School District 24, there are 4,000 fewer seats funded than should have been based on the identified seat need in the current plan. How did seat need dramatically decline in certain districts rise in others and still result in no additional seat need by 2024. The council recognized the need for an accurate seat need assessment, which is why it was a key recommendation of the council's March 2018 report on school planning and siting called Planning to Learn the School Building Challenge. We understand that the DOE and SCA do not solely bear the burden for implementing these recommendations, and many of them require coordination and cooperation across multiple city agencies. However, the recommendations related to transparency and the integrity of the seat, identified seat need are within the DOE and SCA's control. To that end, I am pleased the Council passed legislation requiring the agencies to share data and methodology related to identified seat need, and I look forward to reviewing that information once it is received in November 2019. The Planning to Learn report also calls for a formal process for the identification of pre-K and 3K seat need. This is absent from the capital plan. While the creation of pre-K and 3K seats is necessarily different from K-12, to funded 3K and pre-K projects must result from our best empirical estimation of need. 
The city has committed to providing a pre-K seat for all four-year-olds four and is moving toward providing a seat for all three-year-olds who want one. Given this commitment, the capital plan must accurately respond to the need for early childhood education seats and plan for the long-term seat need. In addition, as the birth to five system transitions from ACS to DOE, I want to ensure that we are planning for educational spaces that will serve our youngest students appropriately. Will students younger than three years old be placed in DOE school facilities? If so, how will these facilities be appropriately updated or modified? How will SCA ensure the state of good repair of early learn sites currently leased by ACS that are transferring to DOE? How is SCA engaged in the planning process for this, for this transition more broadly as the DOE takes on serving tens of thousands of additional children? These are all questions that need to be answered. I hope we can learn more about these questions at today's hearing. I join Councilmember Traeger in thanking the Finance and Education Committee staff for their hard work preparing for today's hearing. And with that, I'll turn it over to the Chair of the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, Councilmember Gibson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and Chair Traeger. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here to the City Council. I am Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. I proudly represent District 16 in the Bronx, and I'm proud to serve as Chair of the Subcommittee on Capital. I'd like to thank my fellow co-chairs, Chairs Traeger and Chair Drum for hosting today's hearing and joining with us today. I'd like to thank President Lorraine Grillo and Deputy Chancellor uh, Karen Goldmark for being here today and recognizing that this is a new subcommittee that was created by our speaker, Corey Johnson, earlier this year. And certainly in this new capacity, I am thankful to be here and would like to focus uh, on SCA's general capital planning and budgeting practices. Education capital commitments have totaled $3.55 billion in fiscal 2018, or 30% of all of the city's capital commitments. On the expense side, the fiscal 2019 budget for DOE debt service is $2.68 billion, or 39% of the total debt service budget. The historic investment of $17 billion in the proposed DOE five-year capital plan for fiscal 2020 to 2024 is commensurate with DOE's service expansions. The addition of pre-K and 3K, which I'm very supportive of, 3K is coming to District 9 in the Bronx next September. Very excited about that. The community school program and improved high school graduation <coughs> rates truly means that the Department of Education is providing essentially more services to more students and needs the facilities to match. However, there are always competing demands on the city's capital budget and resources that are invested in education construction, which must be spent wisely and efficiently. We all know the SCA is often praised, as they should be, relative to other agencies for their timeliness and their high commitment rate, which you know I'm a huge fan of, uh, high commitment rates on capital projects. We really appreciate the hard work of President Lorraine Grillo and her team at the SCA. But we also know that there is always room for improvement, and we appreciate President Grillo's willingness to always listen to the City Council and work with us as a partner. In particular, I am disappointed in the presentation of information in the capital plan itself. Over the past 5, 10, 15 years and more, the DOE has undergone dramatic changes with significant expansion of services. Yet the plan that we are considering and discussing this afternoon is essentially the same template that we've been seeing for over a decade. Every five years, the Department of Ed and the SCA are given the opportunity to present a new five-year plan that reimagines and innovatively considers the best way to fund educational facilities needs. School facilities should be intimately connected to pedagogy and the school environment is essential to the success of our students and educators. Here at the City Council, we expect to see more. We expect to see more in part because this City Council has been stepping in to invest in all of the items that we believe are school essentials, but which are treated in the proposed plan as enhancements. Over the past five years, collectively, Council members have invested 600 
million dollars in school capital projects like upgraded bathrooms, gymnasiums, and auditoriums. Why is the burden on elected officials to use our limited discretionary funding resources for facilities that all schools should essentially have? $600 million, and that number grows year after year. These projects really should be planned for in a more systemic way and funded by the administration. As the council member who represents a district in the Bronx that recently underwent a three-year rezoning, the Jerome Neighborhood Plan, I am also interested in discussing our planning process for capacity. I am pleased that commitments were made for two additional schools through the Jerome Avenue rezoning process in School District 9 and School District 10 in the Bronx. The 2015 through 2019 plan funded no additional seats for School District 9, and I am thrilled that the proposed plan funds 1,620 K through 12 school seats in both Highbridge and Mount Eden. We needed this. However, I share my co-chair's concerns that the proposed plan does not include an identified seat need and that the Planning to Learn report recommendations regarding the identified seat need have not yet been implemented. I am also hoping for serious movement forward on the citing recommendations that were included in the report. I want to once again thank Chair Mark Traeger, who's truly been a champion for our students. Uh, collectively in this budget, we secured fair student funding and school accessibility, which were priorities of this city council, as well as our finance chair, Chair Danny Drum, who has also been a champion with his history as an educator in really making sure that this always remains at the forefront of our conversations. Thank you to my colleagues who are here on the committee. I'd like to thank also the Finance and Education Committee staff for all of their hard work in today's hearing, and I look forward to your testimony and to our conversation this afternoon and collectively our work together as we prepare for the next fiscal year 2020 budget. Thank you, Chair Traeger, and thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, thank you, Chair Gibson, and, and I would say that you've also been a champion in your role as chair of, of your committee and as a key member of the budget negotiation team, you have been supportive of all these efforts and leading the way, so we thank you for your leadership as well. I want to thank to both my co-chairs, Chair, Chair Drum and Chair Gibson, I'd like to remind everyone who wishes to testify today that you must fill out a, a witness slip uh, which is located on the desk of the sergeant at arms near the front of this room to allow as many people as possible to testify testimony will be limited to three minutes uh, per person i'd like to acknowledge our colleagues who are here today uh council members uh Gredenchik, salamanca uh matteo who i think might have gotten the gold star today i'm not sure uh landsman uh, adams deutsch kalos uh, borelli and Rose, and if I'm missing anyone, just let me know. Um, and I'd like to, uh, oh, because of time constraints as well, because we have three committees, uh, questions from members will be limited to three minutes, and if time permits, we could have a second round of questions as well. And now we will hear testimony from SCA and DOE, uh, and just uh, if we could uh, ask you to please raise your right hand so we, our council can sw swear you in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony and to respond honestly to council member questions? You may begin. Well, good afternoon, Chairs Traeger, Drum, and Gibson, as well as the members of the Education and Finance Committees and the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. My name is Lorraine Grillo, and I'm the President and CEO of the New York City School Construction Authority. I'm joined today by Karen Goldmark, Deputy Chancellor of the Division of School Planning and Development at the New York City Department of Education. We are very pleased to be here today to discuss the proposed FY 2020-24 five-year capital plan, the largest ever proposed plan. Let me start by sharing that we are continually grateful to the City Council for its strong support and generous funding of our schools. The collaboration we've had is truly critical to our success, and I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity to highlight some of the accomplishments that have come out of our partnership. Air conditioning for all, bathroom upgrades, and physical education space. I'll speak shortly about some additional projects we've collaborated on and our progress to date. The proposed FY 2024 capital plan represents the administration's 
commitment to equity and excellence for all students and builds on the foundation that we developed with, within the current FY 2015 to 2019 capital plan. Here are the highlights of our proposed plan. $7.88 billion for nearly 57 new school seats in fulfillment of the mayor's commitment to reduce overcrowding. $750 million to make 50% of elementary school buildings partially or fully accessible and one third of all buildings fully accessible. $284 million for electrical work to support air conditioning in all classrooms by 2021, advancing the program a full year. $550 million in support of the 3K and Pre-K for All initiatives. $750 million for technology enhancements. As with our current capital plan, the proposed FY 2020-24 plan has funding allocated in three overarching categories our capacity program, totaling $8.8 billion, the capital investments category with $5.2 billion allocated for work in existing buildings, and finally, our mandated programs with $3 billion in funding. The proposed FY 2024 capital plan includes $8.8 billion for the capacity program. Our capacity program consists of four categories, new capacity, 3K and pre-K early education, class size reduction, and capacity rem to remove transportable classroom units. This plan will continue the success we've had in previous plans. As we reach the end of our current capital plan, I'm proud to say we have cited over 40,000 seats of the approximately 44,000 seat funded seats We've cited nearly all of our funded seats, and that's with the mid-plan increase of 11,800 seats. Of the $8.8 .8 billion allocated to capacity, $7.88 billion is dedicated to creating nearly 57,000 new seats through an estimated 88 projects within school districts experiencing the most critical existing and projected overcrowding. That includes just over 8,000 seats, which will be dedicated to addressing overcrowding at the high school level in Queens. Included in our capacity program is $550 million for the city's 3K and Pre-K for All initiative. In addition, $150 million has been allocated to the class size reduction program. Additionally, $180 million is allocated for capacity to remove TCUs, a new program that is part of our effort to remove the remaining TCUs across the city. This program recognizes the need for targeted investments in areas of the city where additional capacity is the only solution available in order to facilitate the removal of TCUs not, not yet slated for removal. The proposed plan directs a total of $5.2 billion for capital investments. Our, pro, our proposed plan includes $2.75 billion dedicated to the capital improvement program. Within this category, we are funding $2.6 billion in work to address the buildings identified in our annual building condition survey as most in need of repairs, including work such as roof and structural repairs and safeguarding our buildings against water infiltration. The capital investment category also includes funding for athletic field upgrades and additional resources for the removal of TCUs. We will continue to make progress on the removal of TCUs through this capital plan. To date, we have removed 198 TCUs and have developed plans to remove 63 more leaving a remaining balance of 93 TCUs. A major focus of our capital improvement program is in our $2.42 billion school enhancement category, and our work is to improve school, and our work to improve school accessibility. Deputy Chancellor Goldmark will discuss that program as well as the investments in our school-based technology infrastructure needs, the other anchor 
to this category of work. In addition to these two major priorities, we are allocating $285 million in additional funding in this plan to the Mayor's Air Conditioning for All initiative, ensuring that all classrooms will have air conditioning in 2021, a year ahead of our original goal. This is a key part of advancing equity now, and that's why we're speeding up our timeline to increase this work. By adding this funding, we'll be able to upgrade the electrical systems of our buildings faster so classrooms can support air conditioning units. We're working around the clock on this issue, and more and more classrooms will continue to see units installed in the weeks and months ahead. The mandated program category with $3 billion allocated includes approximately $650 million for boiler conversion conversions in buildings currently using number four oil. The remaining funds are assigned to cover other required costs, including the SEA's wrap-up insurance and completion of projects from the prior plan. Public feedback plays a crucial role in our capital planning process. Each year we undertake a public review process with community education councils, the city council, and other elected officials and community groups. We offer every CEC in the city the opportunity to conduct a public hearing on the plan, and we partner with individual council members and CEC, CECs to identify local needs. We have started our public hearings throughout the city, and as of today, we ha will have joined 16 CECs to discuss the proposed five-year capital plan. Thank you again for your partnership and support, I will now turn it over to Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, who will discuss additional aspects. Thank you, President Carrillo. Good afternoon, Chairs Traeger, Drum, and Gibson, and all the council members here today. My name is Karen Goldmark, and I am Deputy Chancellor of the Division of School Planning and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. The Division of School Planning and Development was created to bring together oversight of space planning and management including the development of new schools, school redesigns, and coordination with charter as well as non-public schools. This division also leads our accessibility efforts, oversees the Education Construction Fund, and maintains a close working relationship with the SEA. I would like to echo President Grillo's sentiment and thank you for your continued support of our schools. I'm excited to work with the council in my new role and to ensure thoughtful planning that supports great schools for all of New York City's students. This capital plan is a demonstration of Chancellor Carranza's commitment to look at our work through the lens of equity and to empower our students and families to advocate for their school communities. In his listening tour last spring, the Chancellor very clearly heard students, school communities, advocates, and elected officials highlight key areas we needed to improve upon so our school buildings meet the needs of our students and advance our equity and excellence for all agenda. These issues included accessible buildings for students and families with disabilities, and learning that is supported by 21st century technology. <coughs> I'm proud to say that the Chancellor took action and is proposing historic investments in these areas, all with an eye toward advancing equity for every one of our, school, of our students. The proposed plan allocates by far the largest amount ever toward the critically important work of making our school buildings more accessible. This proposed $750 million investment developed in conjunction with families and advocates, will transform buildings with newly accessible bathrooms, classrooms, and auditoriums, creating many more opportunities for our students with accessibility needs to learn in an equitable environment. We greatly appreciate the Council's support in this area. Our team has been meeting with students, families, and community partners to ensure that we truly understand the needs of students and can make the necessary changes as quickly as possible. We are committed to making a third of the buildings in every district fully accessible by 2024, and at least 50% of our buildings housing elementary school grades fully or partially accessible by 2024. Another anchor of the plan is $750 million, an allocation towards improving school-based technology. The majority of the $750 million is intended for the School Tech Refresh Initiative, which will allow us to replace critical equipment such as routers, switches, and firewall wireless connection points in schools. Upgrading also ensures that the equipment has the latest security protections and controls in place. 
The school tech refresh plan also includes access points in all parts of the school building, not just classrooms. Additionally, the DOE plans to invest approximately $350 million of its Smart Schools Bond Act allocation to continue developing and expanding its technology infrastructure in school buildings and to acquire necessary learning technology equipment. This will allow more students to have fast access to essential science, technology, engineering, math, and computer science materials online. Our goal is to provide all students and educators with the essential tools for academic achievement and professional success in today's digital age. Students across all of New York City's great neighborhoods will see the benefits of this proposed five-year capital plan. In the areas critical to advancing equity and excellence for our students, we are making, literally, the largest investments ever. There will always be more work that needs to be done. In a system this large with over 1,400 unique buildings, the projects can be endless. We will continue to update our capital plan on an annual basis in response to needs from our school communities, and we will seek your input in that process. We are thankful again for all of your collaboration and generous support of capital projects. Our students have been able to expand and improve their educational experience because of these projects, and we look forward to seeing our future students benefit as well. Thank you again for allowing us to testify today, and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We've also, just want to note, we've also been joined by uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. Um, I guess I'll, I'll open up uh, with some questions and turn over, turn over to my uh, co-chairs and colleagues. Um, thank you both for your testimony. I, as I mentioned in my opening <coughs> statement, and as included in the Council's letter to the SCA and DOE regarding our vision for the five-year capital plan, We'd like to see an overhaul of the school enhancement projects portion of the plan to recognize the full set of school facilities that are essential and, and ensures all schools have these facilities. Um, how do you respond to this requested uh, policy shift? Thank you, Council Member. Um, the capital plan itself uh, is very prescriptive. In terms of our le enabling legislation, it's very clearly laid out how we are to deliver the plan. And specifically to educational enhancements, it clearly states that the plan should describe programs for the redesign and reconfiguration of space within educational facilities as educational enhancements. So instead of, uh, as we talked about, our major capital programs having to do with roofs and, and systems, anything that we're doing within the space to change it in any way is listed as an enhancement. Right, I, but I, I would just note that you recognize our concern here sure. that items that we feel are critically essential to us, any school building are listed as sort of like these elective optional enhancements that should not be optional. They should be essential parts of any school. We absolutely agree. Again, this is uh, how we are prescribed to do the capital plan. And prescribed by, by what? Uh, Educational law and our enabling legislation. It's, uh, it's 2590P in educational law. I will look it up. Please. That's my homework assignment. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the uh, 2015 to 2019 plan included small amounts of funding for uh, gymnasiums, library upgrades, and auditorium upgrades. Uh, the proposed plan does not include funding for these categories. Uh, why not? Again, we are moving forward with the uh, phase one of the uh, physical education enhancements. We have about approximately 20, and I have the number here, uh, well over 20 um, new builds, uh, new gyms that are being built, and they are in the, either in construction or in the process of design and will be in construction shortly. We have others that are uh, moving forward with lease space and other uh, things like that. Um, we have not determined what the phase two, these are potentially projects that would reconfigure space within existing school buildings, um, and we do not have that number yet, but as you know, uh, we come back every year with an amendment to the capital plan, so when we have that information, we will certainly include it. Right, I mean, I'll just note that for these categories of these upgrades, whether it's, um, uh, you know, an auditorium, um, library, gymnasium, I think, President Grillo, you would agree that many times it's really the local council members that are 
shouldering the burden uh, yes. on these items. Um, yes. And we just believe that these sh there should be a base level of, you know, uh, support that the administration provides to these schools that our resume dollars are used to truly supplement for, you know, for example, the, com the computer lab should be in the building and our resume dollars could just add additional computers. That's how it should work. The wiring should be there and our resume dollars just could build a, a new STEAM or STEM lab. That's how I believe, but right now uh, we just find ourselves having to fund basic items such as wiring uh, time and time and you, we've talked about this and we're going to continue to push this because th this I think just the system is just not sustainable. I, I want to quickly uh, go into uh, the issue of transparency that I raised as well in my opening statement. Um, what system does SEA use to create the five-year capital plan? What system? Right. We have, a, are you talking about capacity or specifically? Just, you know, from a practical, what is there some sort of a program? Like, what? How do we? How do we create it? Yeah, we have a specific program within the SEA. Uh, it's not an off-the-shelf off program. This is something that was created at the SEA. Right, and so to follow up on that, uh, does the system work with other city systems used for budgeting and capital project management? No, it does not. So it is a separate in-house system. Do you think it should be cognizant of what's happening in other agencies and, and other departments? I think we've been fairly successful in our use of the system up until now. Um, I'm not sure specifically what you're suggesting or what issues. I mean, I think it touches on some of the items that was highlighted in, in the planning uh, report that we worked on here in the council that sometimes there's not enough uh, coordination, communication across different agencies. Uh, to make decisions with whether it's city planning, whether it's buildings and others, um, to kind of make the system more interactive with uh, other other agencies. And um, I th we had a whole hearing on this. Uh, yes, we example. did. And, and so I think that that's one of the, I think my colleagues, my uh, co-chairs will also kind of delve into that. Uh, also, speaking of 21st century systems, uh, the council has long requested the five-year capital plan be produced in machine readable format and SEA has cited legacy systems as preventing this. Correct. Has any consideration been given to upgrading or changing systems so the five-year plan can be published in a machine-readable format? Again, we have, we've had this discussion many times. Uh, we certainly understand uh, the concern. This would be an expensive, time-consuming effort. Uh, we would certainly consider it as we consider all the recommendations that the council has. Uh, you mentioned it would be expensive. I mean, for example, has do it like a Department of Information Technology, you know, offered assistance or to, to upgrade the system to the 21st century to make it. I think it benefits all of us if we. I think our system is is um, very uh, adequate, not more than adequate to to do the actual capital planning. It is. Um, it uses our BCAS information. It uses our seat need information, all of the above, and puts it into the format that is required, again, by the education law in that particular, as I said, very prescriptive format. Um, we do keep very close contact and we work very closely with other city agencies. So, um, you know, other than that, no, I don't believe that DOIT has anything that would even compare to what we do at the SEA. So from at, at the ground level, just practically speaking, yeah. like how does SEA and DOE make information about proposed uh, capital projects to schools available to communities such as principals, parents, and educators? Our how does this trickle down to the, to the local level? Our capital plan in its entirety right. is on our website. Right. Anyone from any school can find out the, the projects that are planned in their particular school just by looking it up on the website. And, and how, are, how are they, beyond the website, which I appreciate, but how are they engaged in the process? Sure. In design and implementation? And sure, happy to, happy to explain that. Right. First of all, there are several different kinds of projects, okay? If we're doing a project within an existing school building, okay, we will certainly meet with the school, the principal, UFT, 
Parents Association, we will do a pre-construction meeting where we will talk about, these are major systems that must be upgraded. Again, a roof, a roof that's leaking, obviously needs to have that repaired. So we'll have that pre-construction meeting. Um, there's not gonna be any room for d design. Certainly it's a roof and we need to do it. So um, throughout the life of the project, we will continue meeting with the school to update them on where we are. So that, that is one type of, of meeting that we have. With regard to new capacity, if there is a principal, uh, we will certainly include those principals in design meetings throughout. Um, we will, if there's no principal named yet, we will certainly include the superintendent in those designs. So um, that, that's constant. Now, if it's a new bill, there are, is no existing parent association because there's no school. So again, where there are people that are actively involved, we include them. Um, and when you mentioned we'll consult with them, we'll speak to them, does that mean getting their feedback and incorporating Absolutely. their feedback Absolutely. in changing designs? In a very recent uh, design of a building that we're doing in Queens, not only did we meet with parents, we met with uh, educators, of course. We met with community groups about four or five different times. So we do that, yes. That's part of our, our usual process. I, okay. Um, quickly jump to accessibility. Sure. Uh, the announcement uh, that accompanied the release of the proposed plan said that $750 million investment in accessibility would allow SCA to ensure that at least half of all elementary school buildings in each school district are at least partially accessible. Is there a goal for accessibility at the middle school and high school level? Uh, and if not, why not? I'm gonna turn that over to the Deputy Chancellor. Okay. Thank you. The seven, proposed $750 million investment in accessibility actually follows the model developed by the council with the $150 million that was added last June. So first of all, thank you very much for that funding and for bringing the issue really to the forefront and the center of the discussion. We're very grateful for that. The goals that we laid out were developed in conjunction with advocates. And the goal of accessibility in elementary schools is a focus because number one, this is where we have the greatest challenge. And number two, this is where we have the greatest number of school buildings. So we do very much anticipate having projects for middle school and high schools because they are further along in terms of accessibility already. They are relative to elementary schools they are part of it, but the elementary schools are the main priority because we do have a challenge in elementary schools. And we'd love to see the system be fully, fully accessible. This is a great step in that direction. It's the, by far the largest investment that's ever been made in school accessibility in New York City in a capital plan. Uh, and we are really looking forward to the work. So at first, I, I do appreciate your acknowledgement of uh, the uh, council's uh, you know, prioritization of this issue. And I just want to actually thank the families, the parents, the advocates. Your work made a significant impact uh, because, I, you know, obviously this was a priority for us in our budget uh, response and in, in our budget to begin with. But hearing the testimony and hearing the personal stories and, and visiting schools and seeing this, seeing what, what our children are confronted with and how they're basically denied uh, not just education, but denied dignity. Um, that, that, that reached our budget rooms. The speaker was personally really, I mean, he, to his credit, he stayed during uh, many of, of, the, of the hearings and heard from advocates and Chair Drum, who goes to, obviously he chairs all of them. It, it really made an impact. And I just wanna thank all the families and the advocates for their outstanding, passionate advocacy and keep it up because obviously folks are listening and we're, we still have a long way to go but certainly we welcome a $750 million investment, which is a big down payment, but certainly much, much, more, much more work, work to do. Um, I will just note, uh, Deputy Chancellor, that uh, <coughs> I understand uh, some of the uh, answers about elementary schools being, we have a lot of them, but we also wanna make sure that as they progress through their educational career, that that dignity and that access to that point doesn't, doesn't just end and cut off there. They, move on to middle school and high school. So we, we, we have to have a more comprehensive, I think, approach. And I think that we, we have the capacity to do that. We should, we should. 
Um, and we will, uh, this council will continue to prioritize the issue of capital money for accessibility uh, for our school. So just giving you a little bit of a heads up as we enter our, our, budget, our budget process. Um, I want to, one quick question on uh, air conditioning, then we'll turn over to my co-chairs. The deal we rolled out, the air conditioning initiative, uh, some schools um, received air conditioners before they could support these additional ACs because they didn't have the, the upgrades, the wiring. Can you explain why this happened? So we're very excited about air conditioning for all, and we're moving very quickly. We advanced the timeline uh, to be one year faster so that it, the initiative will, be, will reach its full 100% uh, throughout the system by 2021 instead of 2022. Electrical and wiring upgrades in buildings take longer than ordering air conditioners, so that would explain why in some cases schools already have the air conditioners and are scheduled to have the electrical upgrades, but those are complicated and do take time. Right, I, I would just point out, Deputy Chancellor, that uh, first of all, I, would you agree that air conditioners are essential items in school buildings and not just luxury items? I think we can all agree that last June was a great example of how difficult it can be uh, in classrooms when there isn't air conditioning in place, and this is something that Chancellor Cardanza experienced firsthand in his listening tour. He heard from students, he heard from parents, and he actually, every, uh, every time he went on a school visit, he came back and said, when are we getting finished with air conditioning <laughs> again? Can we move that up? Can we move that up? And he has been pushing hard for us to accelerate this. It's right. definitely a priority. Right, and I, I think the mayor heard it too when he <laughs> would uh, have town halls and gymnasiums and cafeterias and schools and it was awfully hot in them. <laughs> and uh, so, again, kudos to the parents and advocates in the school communities for effectively advocating. And I welcome this policy shift because in the last administration, the former mayor did not acknowledge that these were essential items, uh, although I'm pretty sure his office is air-conditioned and <laughs> where, where, where he's at. Um, so um, I, I appreciate that. I would just urge you that there are schools that have, have received air conditioners, but they cannot use them. And it's not just an air conditioner issue, it's also an issue where if the wiring is bad, we can't put in a computer lab, we can't put in steam labs, we can't do a lot of things with the schools. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying this, but I have schools in my district that were built with money from the New Deal that have not seen new wires since the New Deal. It's time to give them a New Deal, uh, yes. 2018 New Deal. Uh, so I will be conscious of time and turn over now to, to oh, we've also been joined by a number of members. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, Ulrich, Rodriguez, Levine, Van Bramer, and Cohen. And I'll turn over now to my uh, co chair, Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair Traeger. And yeah, I mean, I was a uh, public school teacher for 25 years, and I taught in an unair un conditioned classroom for all 25 years, and including summer school. I don't know why my principal stuck me up on the, on the top <laughs> floor. I don't, I don't know. I was the UFT rep, though, so, you know, and that might have had something to do with it. No, I'm only kidding. Anyway, um, and I also want to just reiterate the, the words of, of, of our chair in terms of uh, schools being accessible. And um, advocates for children today, I think it was today, but I saw it on Twitter this morning, actually, uh, released an excellent video on the impact it has on students and their ability to select schools. And that's why I think one of the reasons, I think one of the things you focused on was um, for high schools as well, and how important that is in terms of um, the decisions that some of these students have to make when they go to a high school, whether it's based on accessibility, whether it's just the first floor, whether it's the whole school, and in and, and one point in the video, the school was accessible, but the bathroom wasn't, you know, and so that even remains an issue. But uh, we are working on it, and um, that's $750 million in the budget, I think, is, is a good start. So, um, all right, let me, let me just go to a couple of things that um, kind of jumped out at me uh, when reviewing the, the uh, November plan. So did the um, SCA recalculate an identified need as of 2024 in preparing the fiscal 20 to 24 five-year capital plan? This capital plan, again, acknowledges the mayor's commitment to fund 83,000 seats. Uh, we do our projections yearly. Um, actually, they're up online right now for the future, and we will continue to do that. And as you may remember, in the last plan, uh, midway through the plan, the mayor increased, because the need was great, increased uh, the funded seats by 11,800 seats. 
Um, so if the need does show up, I'm sure that those things will materialize as time goes so by. So that's where we may have a, a point of disagreement. This particular plan and the information in the plan acknowledges the funding of 83,000 seats total. So that's where I think we're going to have a point of disagreement because um, that's 57,000 seats, I think, that you're talking about. Correct. But that's, that number is the same as what we're talking about now. So in 2024, we're guaranteed to have more people. I mean, the, the population, I think, of the city is projected to hit 9 million by that time, if I'm not mistaken, and definitely going up. If I could be off on that number somewhat. But with that, it's going to bring the need for additional school seats. Mm -hmm. So we would have liked to have seen that in the plan um, because it, it definitely is going to go up. Um, when I was going through the plan also, I looked at um, District 24, for example, and um, I saw that um, it's approximately 3,900 and something, almost 4,000 seats short of what it was originally planned going back to the November 17 identified seat need. Can you explain why that's there? It seems to be a reduction, 3,961 seats. Excuse me. As we were preparing the plan, um, we looked at throughout the city at all the districts. In that particular district, in District 24, I think we've added more seats than any other district in the city in the last five years. So um, we reallocated some of the funding in those districts that need um, additional seats uh, and have not had the opportunity to get new schools built. We have lowered the percentage of overcrowding in District 24 I believe by somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%. So uh, we've been very successful. We will continue to fund seats in that area. But again, other districts throughout the city also have needs and we were cognizant of that. So that's somewhat disappointing to me because not only because I represent that district, but it still remains the highest need district in, out of all the districts. So although, and I will guarantee that you have made some progress, but still it's 3,961, I think, District, District 15 also was reduced by 3,023 seats. Again, the, we've turned the tide in both of those districts. We've, we've built a great deal of seats in both of those districts. Again, we will continue to build in those districts but other districts also have a tremendous need as well. But, but this, that need still remains, right? There, there's still an acknowledgement that 3,900 seats are needed in 24 and 3,000 so seats are needed in That 15. number has reduced somewhat. I will get to the exact numbers. Okay, the construction of 83,000 seats identified across the two plans will not be complete until 2028. How does the SCA plan to ensure projects and their associated seats are not rolled over from 2020 to 2024. I um, actually can only speak to the record that we have. Again, in the current capital plan, we have cited 40,000 seats. And half of the seats in this capital plan did not come to us until midway through the plan. We have a record of success and I continue to believe that we will be successful in the, in the new capital plan. Okay, in um, the 2015 to 2019 plan, um, of the 88 new capacity projects, 13 projects um, which were originally identified um, were, rolled over, uh, were rolled over into the 2024 plan. Can you just tell us why sure. that was done? Sure. The, the, what happens basically is when we find a site, we negotiate with the owner, we come to an agreement, we come through our public review process, and then we begin the design. Sometimes that design doesn't come until towards the end of, for example, those projects that are in design right now will not go into construction into the, until the next capital plan. So those are seats are rolled over. So they moved over, okay. Um, can you describe how SCA is working with the DOE to prepare for the transition of um, birth 
to the uh, five care system from ACS to DOE? Sure. Uh, right now, the uh, DOE has asked the SCA to assess the various ACS sites, which we are in process right now. Um, and we will see next steps after that. We've just gotten that assignment. So you're just starting to estimate what the cost of good repair would be in those sites as Which well? I would, what the condition is. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, many of them, would, would you be taking over sites in NYCHA buildings? Um, we have not looked at any NYCHA buildings at this point. Is that in the plan to look at them or? Yes, yes. Yes. So they really need to be looked at. Yeah. Um, and I brought it up at Fairly. other hearings as well, that because um, I was a daycare center director and a teacher before I went to the DOE, and um, a lot of um, health concerns there, including lead sure. concerns there. So we hope that um, that would be part of, of putting them into a state of good repair. Um, is SCA introducing design changes in new construction to accommodate children younger than four years old? in DOE school buildings themselves? Well, at this moment, I believe that um, we have, uh, particularly pre-K for all in those instances, we've made changes to classrooms that would suit uh, pre-K students. Um, I do not believe or I do not know of any sightings of 3K, but I'm sure we will do exactly the same thing. Okay, and with the 3K seats, uh, none of those 3K seats, the need is in the capital plan, is that correct? Correct, we've just, they've begun to introduce those districts that will have pre-K. Uh, we've begun to work on citing those districts, but at this point, we don't have a, a, a number attached to that. So again, because we amend every year and because we come back to you every year, those issues will be clarified as time goes by. It's very early in the process. And how do you go about um, determining the need for three K seats. So the need for three and, w and where do you and how do you and not only the need but where you fund them. So three K and pre K of course have an innovative service delivery model where some of the services are provided by DOE, some are provided by community based organizations. So the way we calculate seat the seats is really different from the K through 12 environment, and that's uh, part of the process is assessing existing capacity in the community. And now with the early learn transition, that's another element that comes in to how we determine how many seats we've essentially already got and how many seats we will need going forward. So it's a really a very different process. Uh, the capital investment, I believe, in 3K seats at budget adoption totaled uh, $771 million um, across fiscal 19 to 2021. Uh, this included $306 million in fiscal 2019. Can you tell us how that funding is being used uh, and what's being done with it right now? In, in the capital? In yeah. The capital budget? Yes, um, obviously leasing. Uh, reconfiguring space within leases and that sort of thing. We've created 8,800 pre-K seats over the last couple of years. Okay, and I think um, we're supposed to get a report on that funding by the end of this year. Okay. Uh, and we're gonna get that? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, let me do accessibility again. The SCA has identified accessibility projects to be completed with the $50 million invested in fiscal 19. Um, and when can we expect those projects to be identified? We will get back to you with when, with specific projects. We've already begun the planning process for all of that funding that you generously, generously provided. Have you started that process of going out to see where you're needed, where those funds are needed the most? Absolutely, so we have almost completed the process of uh, completing the building accessibility profiles for every school building in New York City. We have, last I heard, we just had about 100 or so left out of the 14, over 1,400 buildings. Um, and as a result of those, we look at where the greatest opportunity is for enhancing accessibility and specifically prioritizing districts that have the greatest need in terms of being the furthest from meeting the accessibility targets that we've set. And, and that's done by a team going out, or is that done by principals? How is that uh, conducted? That's, a, that's, a, that's a, t a team going out from the space management unit at DOE. 
Okay, um, let me talk a little bit about class size reduction. The council's understanding of class size reduction projects funded in the 2015-19 capital plan was that these seats would be in addition to those funded under new capacity mm -hmm. that are specifically meant to um, meet identified seat need. However, the proposed plan counts two class size reduction projects toward meeting the 83,000 seats uh, needed in the 2015 to 19 plan. Why is that? If you give me a moment, sir. I, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I really am not clear on the answer to that question. Okay, so and, and then that. also in the plan, there was no provision for new class size reduction. Is that yes, correct? Yes, we have several projects that we are under consideration right now, but we are not. We have, again, as I mentioned before, we have a task force that gets together with DOE, and we look at those projects and we evaluate them, and then we become public with, the, with that decision. Okay. So we'll and, be back to you. And with the current uh, 2015 to 19 plan, how are you tracking um, how that funding is being used? Well, we have three projects currently in process right now. So that's, that's the funding. But how do you track that? How do you go back and look at that and evaluate that? Well, again, what we do is uh, through, through design and, and then construction. I mean, obviously, it's a low bid kind of construction. So those, that's how we track how these projects are moving forward so in the, terms of dollars. But then let me be a little bit more specific. Yeah, how do you evaluate whether they're actually reducing class size? Ah, I, I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize. Because we have not yet completed those projects. So it's very difficult to say. But we will, once those projects are completed, we'll be able to make a judgment. So that, is that always done with class size reduction projects? This is the very first time this capital plan, the capital plan has had that category. Again, the reason for class size reduction was for persistently overcrowded buildings that may not be in a district that is overcrowded, but they, for whatever reason, um, physical location, whatever, it's unable to move kids to another school. So in fact, we put money into to satisfy that need. One of them, uh, 131 in Queens, um, is very, very far away from any other school within the district. It's been a persistently overcrowded school. That was one of the schools that we chose after going through committee with DOE to make that determination. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over because I know council members have a lot of questions, but before I do, in April, you committed to working with us on implementing the um, learning, uh, or the planning to learn recommendations. Mm -hmm. Can I get your commitment on that again to Absolutely. meet with council staff? Absolutely. Okay. We always welcome working with the All right. city council staff. Thank you, President Grillo. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chancellor. Council Member Gibson. Thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you, Ch Chair Traeger, and good afternoon again. Uh, great to see both of you, and we appreciate your partnership, and certainly this five-year capital plan is a testament of really the commitment of this administration. Uh, I think it's a recognition of the challenges that we've faced, but also the expected challenges we know we will continue to face. Um, and, you know, making sure that we address population growth, particularly in those neighborhoods where um, the growth has been completely exacerbated compared to other neighborhoods, um, it's really important that, you know, we continue to have dialogue. When I cited that $600 million, it's really because the City Council has been an active and engaging partner. Um, my local capital that I get just in my district alone, a majority of that funding every year for five years has gone to schools, to upgrades of facilities and technology. And as Chair Traeger mentioned, I mean, we call it school enhancements. To me, these are necessities. Air conditioning should be a necessity. Uh, bathroom upgrades and all the basic essentials should always be, you know, necessities and not luxuries. Um, and so we want to make sure that the City Council is an active partner and we will continue to engage with you. But a lot of these projects, particularly the larger scale um, upgrades to auditoriums, and gymnasiums and playgrounds are expensive. 
um, and they take some time, sometimes more than a fiscal year. And for those of us that have uh, term limits, um, we have a few more budgets to go. Uh, so today's you know, conversation around the five-year capital plan for me is really making sure that we can expedite, but obviously increasing efficiency is, is truly important. So I first wanted to ask about the neighborhood rezonings, because that's been of particular importance to me. But the larger neighborhoods that we have rezoned from East New York, East Harlem, Far Rockaway, Jerome in the Bronx, and Inwood, but on a monthly basis, on a much smaller scale, we pass out smaller rezonings every single month. Um, we are creating an incredible amount of housing, and so I wanted to understand how SCA and DOE works with other agencies, particularly Department of City Planning, um, to make sure that there is a dialogue on the expected growth within a community. Uh, we assume every new construction of housing is going to bring families with school-aged children. And you know, while we were successful in our rezoning, um, that's just one rezoning uh, of many more to come. So what is the interagency coordination with the other agencies as it relates to population growth and ensuring that we are citing school seats? Absolutely. Thank you, um, Chair Gibson. We work very, very closely with Department of City Planning. Um, actually, we um, work together more than not. We are um, constantly talking with them about the large-scale rezoning, certainly. Um, and as you know, we have a seat at the table when those negotiations and decisions are taking place. On the smaller scale rezoning, certainly they alert us on those rezonings. We use that as information that informs our um, pro uh, projections. And we work closely with city planning on comparing those projections. So we're always in touch with city planning on these issues. Okay, does that also include HPD as well? Are they a part of any conversations? Yeah, through DCP, through okay. city planning, yes. Okay, okay. So we recently passed legislation that you were supportive of, Local Law 168, um, that relates to establishing a task force yes. on school siting, mm -hmm. and there will be an expected report that will be uh, issued in July of next year. So I wanted to understand, is there an update you could provide for us? Are there any conversations that have taken place on the uh, formulation of this task force yeah. as of yet? Yeah. Uh, yes, I understand that the, the selection of that task force is underway. Is underway. So we are, we are looking forward to that. Yes. We're, okay. we're in the process of finalizing each of the representatives from all the agencies, and we anticipate meeting early in 2019. Okay, great. Uh, we'll keep talking as we get closer to July. Um, SCA had a project labor agreement in place for the last capital plan on capital improvement projects for the 2015-2019 plan. So I wanted to ask, uh, the current plan that's in place, has it been successful? Have you learned any lessons from it? And moving forward, are you also going to adopt another project labor agreement for this five-year capital plan? We hope to. Uh, it has been tremendously successful. It has uh, helped us in our planning. Um, what the project labor agreement allows us to do is to keep um, consistency within the, the various building trades so that we understand what overtime is going to cost us. We understand, as you, as you well know, our capital improvement work is all done after regular school hours. So in um, a typical construction project, that would be overtime, and in some cases, time and a half, and, and the like. So the project labor agreement allows us to have a consistent flat rate. Um, it also puts all of the trades uh, having the same vacation days, because you would find out in other, in other situations, carpenters may have one day, um, plumbers may have another. So we need those consistencies plus it exempts us from the Wix law, which is a big savings for right. for SCA. So moving forward with this, with the next five-year capital plan, being that we are 
uh, spending more, we are building more, we're accommodating more students uh, and educators, do you think the new project labor agreement plan will have, obviously we want to reduce overtime <laughs> as much as we can um, and really target costs, so do you expect in those conversations with all of the labor unions to make sure that we can have more members a part of the PLA so that we estimate better? Would that at this point in time, absolutely. There's no okay. question that having a PLA and working with the building trades has been extraordinarily helpful to us. And we hope to negotiate an even better PLA. Um, I will tell you, though, that the, uh, the building trades have all cooperated as part of the PLA. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, I wanted to ask about the budgets for the program categories that are under the school enhancements projects. For example, there was 50 million that's allocated for bathroom upgrades. So I wanted to ask specifically, uh, I'm a huge supporter of bathroom upgrades, as we all are. Um, if this was a reflection of the fact that 50 million is the amount that's needed to bring all of our bathrooms up to the appropriate condition, uh, and if so, how was this number configured? Uh, so the $50 million is a reflection of, uh, first of all, the s very successful work that's happened in the current capital plan uh, and the next stage of the work. So the way we select bathrooms is by the need and, and condition of the bathrooms. We do this in consultation with principals and community. Community engagement is central to all of the work that we do uh, and increasingly the Facilities planning work is involving community education councils. SCA has developed a really wonderful model for ensuring that CECs understand all of the capital projects going on in a district. And through all of that dialogue, we're developing the lists and the priorities that communities are telling us and that we know from our assessments of the buildings. Okay, so it'll be identified on a priority basis, but in consultation with school officials, principals, et cetera. School leadership team, right? Absolutely. Okay, so another area that's very important to me as well, a lot of the school food advocates um, have really come to the council members. We have successfully pushed for universal uh, free lunch in middle schools, uh, universal in-classroom breakfast at elementary, so we're very big fans of food access uh, and the quality of food, but also we're concerned about the conditions of our cafeterias and the kitchen. So in the uh, capital plan, there's 25 million under interiors for kitchen areas and 25 million for a program to renovate uh, cafeterias and serving lines under facility restructuring. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to understand a little bit more of that and what kinds of projects will this fund? So we care about the cafeteria as well as the kitchen in the cafeteria as well, right? How is that going Feel to work? <laughs> I'll start and President Grillo yeah, can jump please. in. So you're absolutely right. These are two really important initiatives. One is in terms of kitchens, so ensuring that our kitchens have the equipment that they need um, to serve, obviously, delicious and nutritious meals. The cafeteria enhancement program is something that started as a pilot and has been very successful. What we found is that when we enhance the cafeteria and modernize the cafeteria, uh, Two things happen, students eat more of the food and they waste less of the food. So it's actually really wonderful from a food access point of view. It's important for the overall uh, atmosphere of the building and conditions for learning. It's something that we found is uh, a really powerful positive effect on schools and we have prioritized those according to developing a model for middle schools and high schools that works. And we are, of course, taking an equity lens in this and everything we do. So in consultation with communities, we are prioritizing schools based on if they have been traditionally underserved. This is one of the factors. It's also, of course, the condition of the cafeteria. Is it possible that the information and data that you are compiling could be shared with the council as it relates to some of the priorities of the kitchen and cafeteria upgrades, some sure. of the criteria using? As we, de as we develop the prioritizations, we're happy to share that with you, of course. Okay, great. Uh, another uh, big project that I'm a huge fan of, uh, was very supportive during my assembly days, are school-based health centers. 
and we have an active partnership with many of our health providers, specifically the Bronx, Montefiore Health Center, Children's Aid Society, Morris Heights, et cetera. Um, as we open more of our school-based health centers on campuses, I'm noticing that there sometimes is a decrease in the number of school nurses. So I wanted to just bring that up as a side note to make sure that we talk on a side conversation about school nurses, but specifically about the school-based health centers, um, I didn't see any funding for that in the proposed plan. So I wanted to understand what are we doing with school-based health centers and our priority and why there wasn't any funding included in the plan. Well, I, I can speak to um, the fact that we've done a great job in the Bronx on school-based health centers and the reason that was so successful is because you have active providers who um, really want to be involved in school-based health. If you do not have an active provider who is requesting a school-based health center, building one and leaving it empty is not what we'd hope to do. So until such time as we have providers that are requesting that and the location is appropriate, for example, it's not across the street from a health center, certainly we will in, uh, entertain any request for that. But again, it really, without an active provider who can sustain that school-based health center, um, building one is, is probably not a good use of our funds. So in the last capital plan, there was $20 million added for the construction of school-based health centers in school districts like mine with high concentrations of students in temporary housing. Um, but as of the February 2018 proposed amendment that was adopted by this council in June, we identified four projects that SCA gave us totaling $10 million dollars um, that was identified. So does that mean that because there's no allocation in the new capital plan for school-based health centers, does that say that we don't have a need? Or as you mentioned, we need more providers. And if we need more providers, then what are we doing to work and engage others to make sure that we can continue to expand on the number of school-based health centers we have? And again, uh, we, we certainly agree that um, the school-based health centers, for example, four of those school-based health centers are scheduled to open for, um, for this, in this school year. Um, we don't have additional funding. Again, let me go back to the fact that in the Bronx, in your area, in Montefiore, is a very active provider um, and is always looking for those schools to place the school-based health center. Um, we have not had requests anywhere else at this point. So unless, again, if the need arises, we will certainly entertain that. Okay, we're going to continue talking. That's uh, very, very important to this council, and I think it's a reflection of the ongoing need. Um, what we've seen in terms of school-based health centers are the uh, services for medical, dental, vision, um, the continuity of care, the support, the relationships that have been developed with students and educators, um, very, very successful. So I'm grateful we've identified four that will open, um, but certainly we need more and we'll continue to talk about that. I just have one final question that I wanted to ask about the building condition assessment survey. Uh, we call it BCAS. Yes. And I wanted to get from you a general understanding of the process by which the results of BCAS are reviewed and projects are even identified identified for the five-year capital plan. How does that work? Sure. Um, well, as you know, every year we send a team of architects and engineers to every single building to rate all of the major systems within the building. And of course, it's based on performance and age and all of the other details, what's working, what's not working. With that said, we rate them one through five, five being the worst condition. And of course, when we're creating our capital plan, the first projects that we want to, uh, to undertake are those five fives. Unfortunately, we'd love to be able to do um, all of the projects that are below uh, or above a three, but again, um, you know, we've got a great deal of need throughout the system, and right now that's what we can do, those fives. Okay, thank you. I'll You're turn welcome. it back over to our co-chair. You're welcome. Chair Traeger. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Gibson. Um, and we've also been joined by Council Members Powers, Cornegy, Moya, and Barron. And uh, just a reminder to, my, to our colleagues that we have a, a three minute clock for each member. Uh, we'll, time permitting, uh, we might do a round two because I'm mindful of, of folks who are waiting patiently in, in the audience as well. I think the first member we had up was uh, Council Member Grudenchik. Is he still here? Mr. Chairman, oh. since I'm on all three committees, do I get nine minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Anything um, for you, Barry. At least give me an extra minute. Um, thank you. It is always a pleasure to see Lorraine Grillo, uh, and it's great to meet the new Deputy Chancellor, and we'll be talking uh, in the next few days about some issues in my district. Um, I want to pick up first on something that Chair Gibson uh, mentioned in her opening remarks and that's about discretionary technology. Um, if I don't fund it, they don't get it. It's that simple. And in my initial tour of my schools, when I first was elected three years ago, I, I can't remember this school, but they were working with nine-year-old Mac computers. And I remember the technology teacher telling me he can't even find pieces. You know, they, they salvaged what they could. So this is important. I, I am, I appreciate your comments on um, Deputy Chancellor. I think it's on um, page four of the testimony um, that by 2025, you know, every school of the Computer Science for All initiative, I think that's much too long. Um, I will be a lot older by then, and um, it's one thing that the city tends to do fairly quickly is, is produce the technology, and if we buy it on July 1st, usually by the end of the fiscal year, it's in place and ready to be used. And so. I would ask that that consideration take place because um, the technology is changing so quickly. Um, we are a great center of technology now with um, Google and probably Amazon, and Google just announced an expansion of, I believe, 7,000 jobs, another billion dollars. So this should be a pipeline for our children that are so inclined. It's, it's a great resource for them to have here, and these are excellent jobs for them to get. So. I want you to think about that. The other thing that I would ask, um, I love air conditioning, we all love air conditioning. Uh, in Eastern Queens, uh, I have no fewer than five District 75 schools headquartered in my district. Mm -hmm. Two of them are in standalone buildings, the others share buildings, but almost every school that I have has District 75 students in them. Um, and it is almost cruel that in the summer, these young people are basically stuck in their classrooms in many cases. I have worked um, with the SCA to air condition some of those places uh, with the resources that I am able to bear. But when you're talking about air conditioning, and when you, we really have to um, concentrate on these schools because um, they have no gymnasium in the summer. We know how hot it gets sometimes in May and September, let alone June, July, and August when these children are in school. So it's the auditoriums which are like ovens, the gymnasiums which are like ovens. Um, some of them are air conditioned and it's kind of hit or miss. Some of them have been done by the PTAs in years past, but I would like to hear your comments on that, uh, either, either Ms. Grillo or the Deputy Chancellor. So Ensuring that District 75 facilities are getting at least the same investments and enhancements as every other facility is absolutely a priority for us. We have actually been taking a look at the facilities in which District 75 sites are located. We've also been looking every month to make sure that we actually have enough seats in each district for the District 75 students who are in that district. This has a, been a one of the capacity challenges we've been addressing with great success with the SCA and through reconfigurations of existing school buildings. I, I won't speak for President Grillo, although I'm sure she agrees with me that this is a major priority for both of us and something that we've been actively working on um, and discussing in our new uh, collaboration. In terms of specific sites, I am happy to s speak with you after the hearing okay. about the specific sites because that is one of the ways we answer problems is with okay. specific it, sites. It, it Generally, is, I want to assure you. I appreciate the that, but I know that this is not the final plan and that we will be refining this over the next few months before we get a chance to vote on it again, but I would like you to take a hard look about committing more resources to that. Um, we are making our schools 
fortunately, we, we were here, I was here with uh, Chair Drum that day and the speaker and I think Margaret Chin, we heard the testimony of, of parents of disabled children who couldn't get into school. Um, but now that we're gonna do a better job of getting them into school, we don't want them sitting in, in uh, and all of my classrooms are air conditioned in, in the D75 wings. That seems to be no problem. But these gymnasiums and the auditoriums are, even in June, I'm not talking about August or July, they're, they're like ovens. So, and I'm sure it's not a problem that is just um, in Eastern Queens, I am sure it is throughout the city. So thank you for your thoughts and uh, I look forward to speaking with you, Deputy Chancellor. And I yield uh, my balance of my five minutes to back to the <laughs> chairs. Thank you for, for being so generous. <laughs> Uh, next, uh, we'll hear from Council Member Adams. Thank you to all of the co-chairs um, for a very fine uh, joint hearing today. Uh, I, I have to echo um, my colleague, it's always wonderful to see you, President Grillo. Thank you for everything that you've done uh, in the past for all of us and, and the work that you continue to do for our students and beyond. Uh, I welcome you as well, Deputy uh, Chancellor, welcome. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. Hopefully um, I can get some answers to some quick, quick uh, questions. Um, there is a, a school in my district. I represent District 28, Queens. PS 96 has not had a gymnasium ever. We're talking about enhancements here today. Do we consider gymnasiums enhancements or necessities? Okay. Actually, PS 96, uh, Queens came up in a recent town hall that we did. Um, and as a result of that town hall, we are, we're sending our architects and engineers to look and see if there's a potentially space to build a gym. Okay, do you know when that's gonna be? As far we're, as we're already, time frame for the architects? We're already scheduled to go out there, so it's gonna be in the next couple of weeks. That's wonderful news, thank you for that. Um, I'm also very appreciative for the bathroom upgrades in my district that had not happened for decades and decades, and again, we're talking enhancements, um, as opposed to things that normally, that are just normal. So thank you for that. I will be gathering with my principals again tomorrow. I started an annual tradition last year when I was elected, an annual gathering of the principals in my district. So we will gather together tomorrow and we will compare notes. Um, and I, I really um, expect to see some great things and progress going on with the SCA and beyond. Um, one final uh, question that I had. Last week there was a two alarm fire in my district. Um, within walking distance from my home, PS 160 Walter Francis Bishop School. It started on the roof yeah. of the school and it was due to an SCA construction project that has been going on for a number of years. Can you please tell me the cause of that fire, where we are as far as uh, time frame, what kind of a setback uh, did that cause, if any, for the time frame of completion? Well, I, I don't have the actual dates, but I will tell you this. What I do know about that particular issue was there was a fire on the roof. It had to do with an electric, a temporary electrical wire, and that's how it started. Uh, it was put out very quickly. Uh, we do not feel it will have any impact at all on the schedule for this project. I will tell you, though, this is a, a, one of the main reasons why our capital improvement work is done after school hours. I agree with that and I was very grateful that fire occurred sometime around 6 a.m. or so uh, last Thursday morning. Um, do you know what the completion date uh, of that work will be? I speak with the principal uh, frequently over there and she, she made me laugh the other day when I checked on the students uh, after the fire and she said, you know, I don't know the school without scaffolding. Oh. You know, where I do, I'm from the community, so I do. I said, what, well, I've got several pictures that I can bring you to show you what the school looks like without the scaffolding. So can you give me an, an estimate? I don't have you know? that, but I will get that to you. Terrific, okay. terrific. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember. Just a note, we've also been joined by Councilmember Lander. And next for questions, we'll hear from Councilmember Cornegy. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Um, thank you also uh, for joining us today, President Grillo and uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark. Um, I have a couple of questions. As the um, chair of the MWBE commission here, I have some MWBE related questions. Um, can the SAA provide an update on its MWBE programs, including the mentor program and the internship program with the Guardia Community College? 
I, I, I don't have the figures in front of me. However, I'm, I will provide them. It was a banner year for us. Again, we've, our MWBE program is the best in the city and the state, I will say that. And I will certainly get you the exact numbers, but I will tell you that uh, with regard to our program on Opportunity Academy, which I believe is the program you're talking about with LaGuardia, again, our new class, this is our third class, has begun. Uh, the students are incredible. I've sat in on classes with them. They're doing a fabulous job. And as with the past two classes and graduates, I will tell you they will wind up in a very good place as far as their careers are concerned. Um, we've, the, the folks that have gone through the program, I would say 95% had jobs within a month of finishing the program and the other 5% started their own businesses. So it's something we're extraordinarily proud of, extraordinarily proud of. And again, I'll get you the numbers on the MWBE stuff. So, so like you, I've had the opportunity to sit in on some of the classes and have witnessed some commencements. And I will say that the SEA is, you know, has set a, a gold standard for what we're expe expecting from agencies throughout the network as it relates to MWBEs. Thank you. Um, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about the uh, $6 million allocation many years ago to uh, door alarms in schools uh, through Avante's law. Um, I believe that all of the alarms are installed. Um, you can confirm or deny that. Uh, but I also wanted to ask, I think we're at the, maybe the fifth year or fourth year, um, there should be a maintenance at this point. So if they've all been installed, I want to know what the maintenance program is for that. It's, it's important to me, it was, it was, I was the sponsor of that bill. Um, unfortunately, uh, to be quite honest, that we, we would prefer it if that had not happened. Uh, but the city's response was quick. The allocation of the funding was quick. The installations were quick. Um, and I believe that we were on schedule. I'd just like to revisit and confirm whether or not they've all been installed and whether or not we're up for a maintenance on those at this particular juncture. So they have all been installed, and we're now maintaining the door alarms as part of the, ongo of the ongoing maintenance of the buildings. Uh, and then lastly, you know, as part of the legislation to bring the alarms was also training of staff. Mm -hmm. um, where are we as far as trainings? Has everyone in the buildings been trained? Now, I realize that there is considerable turnover uh, in our schools uh, on an annual basis. I'm curious as to whether or not, though, there's, there's been the prerequisite trainings around alarms and elopement, potentially, of autistic children and that kind of thing. Where are we? So training processes were put in place, but I have to get back to you with the exact specifics on exactly how that was rolled out. And here we are. John, are you crossing your legs because you want to come up and answer? <laughs> Yes, that's why I want to get back to you, because I didn't think I could kick it to, to Mr. Shea. So I can get back to you with the specifics on the how that's rolled into the training. And, and again, I'd appreciate it just from the standpoint of we knew that it was rolling along um, favorably. Uh, sometimes there's a drop off inadvertently uh, on initiatives. And uh, this was an important one for the city that no other child uh, could elope. And conversely, that there couldn't be any um, breaches of entry into buildings and, you know, the potential for disasters like we've seen in other states uh, around school shootings. Um, so that alarm actually provided, a, a, you know, it, it had dualism with it. It, it allowed for, for not, no one to leave unannounced or enter unannounced. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to know where we are with the program. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be happy to get back to you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, next for questions, we have Council Member Barron. Thank you to the chairs and thank you to the panel for coming. I have a general question and then a specific check a question. When will all of the TCUs be gone? Okay, that, Council Member, that's a terrific question and a very difficult one to answer because Why? they're we know what it costs me, to remove sure. a TCU. Why can't we put the money in and get them all done by a given date? Well, because many of those TCUs have children in them. And because of that, one has, one, they are um, reliant on new capacity, new schools. And in some cases, finding locations for those schools are difficult. Uh, relocating those students temporarily if we're building uh, within that school is difficult, but we do it. So what we're doing in this plan, we've funded 
capacity for those TCUs. We've, we've put money into the plan to say where you need to build new capacity, even if the district is not overcrowded, okay. we will do that. So I I'm on the clock. If a TCU is not being utilized, it is, is that at the top of the list? You bet. Okay, so the TCUs in my district that are not being utilized, I can expect to see them gone when? Uh, within the next year. Within the next year, okay. Um, as you know, the East New York Family Academy is going to be a new construction. Right. That, that high school was temporar temporarily relocated and will go back. The TCUs were scheduled to have been removed in July. And as of September, they had not been removed. And when I saw the chancellor, I brought that to his attention. And he promised that they would be removed if he had to go get <laughs> machinery and do it himself. They have been removed, and that's great. My question now becomes, that's just the removal. All the other phases that have to be completed yep. will now be pushed back. So. How is this estimated date been impacted by the delay in the removal of the TCUs? Council Member, I assure you that project is on track to be completed as promised. Oftentimes in construction, there are delays regarding uh, permitting, things like that. But we build in within the schedule, we build in some period of float time that allows us to continue to move forward when those delays occur. So we are on track. September 2021, we'll be cutting the ribbon. That's correct. And uh, the other question that I have relates to the shared space, gymatoriums, cafeteriums, or whatever those combinations are. If we understand that physical education is a critical part of a child's daily education, mm -hmm. why don't we have dedicated gyms that are used for programming for physical activity? Why must it be shared with another space auditorium or cafeteria, which impacts how scheduling can be done? And when I was a principal at PS81, I had a gymatorium cafeteria all in one space with the dividing doors. Wow. And it limited what could be done, and it limited the length of time that a, an assembly program could be held because we had to open the doors for that and it impacted the scheduling for the other spaces. Across the city, um, we've done um, many, many, many of these schools and what we often hear from not just principals but um, CECs and district superintendents and the like is there are particular auditoriums unless it's a um, performance-based school or something like that, are used, the auditoriums are used very rarely. Now, most often, most often, the sites that we have cannot, again, years ago we were able to get very large sites and build very large schools. Right now we're not in that situation across the city. So with these very small sites, we have to make some sacrifices. And if we had to sacrifice anything, it would not be the gym or the cafeteria, but it would be the auditorium. But in a way to allow kids to have performances or have um, a variety of uh, assemblies or whatever, we combine where we have to. I'm real old school uh, uh, chairman uh, drum because we used to have weekly assembly programs. Yeah. And you knew that at once during the year, your class was gonna be on stage <laughs> for a formal production. Just saying. Understood. That's when children learn public speaking and presentation skills and preparations and costumes and set and all of that. But I guess perhaps uh, they're doing a lot of time with other non-educational, in my opinion, activities such as test prep. But we need to get that balance for the educational program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Barron and I would agree. Uh, auditoriums are important. I mean, uh, some, some of the most memorable moments of elementary school, I remember winning my spelling bee championship in the auditorium, <laughs> and I, I will not forget that. So thank you very much uh, for, for your comments. But I do have some 
I think, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we've also heard by Councilman Wander who has questions as well. Sure. Councilman Wander. Thank you very much, Chair Traeger, uh, President Grillo, and Deputy Chancellor Goldmark. It is good to see you, uh, as always. Uh, and thank you for the hard work and substantial capital that's in this plan. Uh, two questions, one on air conditioners and one on District 15. Uh, on air conditioning, uh, as, you know, as one of the council members that led the effort to push the administration and the mayor to commit to get air conditioning in every classroom, uh, I was grateful when uh, the commitment was made, and I'm thrilled that it's being accelerated from five years to four years. Um, you know, as we saw this September, uh, it really is urgent. There were just all those days in September when teachers could not teach and kids could not learn, and there's unfortunately every reason to believe that that's going to keep being true. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the uh, accelerated timeline. Um, uh, I do want to note, and I guess it may have been raised before, I also am the requester of the term and condition on the updates that you give us. Uh, one you gave us in April, the next one's due in January. There were some uh, quality control issues with the April report that I know we identified with just concerns that um, what was on the report and what principals said was the case did not align, and I, I would like to know if you guys are uh, taking some efforts to make sure that the report we get in January uh, does a, a, as a better job, recognizing it's a lot of schools, but we would like you to do as, as good a job as possible as making sure that the information that we get about what work has been done and what work is left to do is, is important. Obviously, if we mistakenly report 100% of the classrooms are covered and they're not, then we're not going to be able to achieve the goal of getting to all of them. Let's go the other way. Great question. I'm going to ask my colleague John Shea to come answer. And while he's walking up, I just want to disagree with one thing you said, which was that uh, it was very hot, and I'm not disputing that, and air conditioning is urgent. You did say that teachers couldn't teach and students couldn't learn, and I don't think you meant to say that, because I'm sure you believe that teachers can teach and students can learn in all kinds of conditions, even though the air conditioning is urgent. It's just when well, in expectations. Well, we don't need to resolve this. Oh, I'm no, I'm not making a big policy. When the classroom temperature is, is 100 degrees, no teaching and learning is taking place. So anyway, we, I, you guys have made a commitment, and I'm glad yes. you're committing. And I'm just sure that students were learning in September, even though it was hot. I'm not, well, I'm not saying no learning took place in the entire month of September. I am saying that there were classrooms. <laughs> Thank you. Some classrooms in September where it was too hot for any meaningful teaching and learning to take place. And, and and the chancellor is in complete agreement that this we're is a We're in agreement priority. on, you know, and I yes. don't think we can do it faster, so. Uh, this you is know, the I, fastest we possibly can. Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll just have to swear you in very quickly. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. You may begin. Uh, good afternoon, council member. Good uh, afternoon. Nice to see you. Thank you for the question. Uh, it, it's a sample answer. Yes, we have been doing a lot of work on that report. We are on track to provide it uh, by January. Uh, we've done a lot of surveying and data scrubbing and analysis on our end, so we, we fully expect the data to be uh, much more accurate uh, than it was in the April report. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask one of my other questions since I think I'm last in line here? Um, so uh, I want to. So thank you. That's good to know. We'll look forward to receiving it. Obviously, what we do when we get it is check with the schools in our districts and say, "Hey, it says here you got the air conditioning," and so they're going to tell us whether they did or didn't. And that's uh, we look forward to being optimistic that it is uh, uh, more accurate. Thank you. All right. So on District 15, um, it is one of the districts with a whole lot of seat need. Um, though District 24 is often rightly cited uh, as the district with the most, uh, with number one, uh, District 15 at this point is basically number two, and this same issue of sort of the implied unfunded seat need is sitting there. So according to the analysis that the council has done of the work that you guys done, acknowledging that you have cited a lot of schools in District 15, so uh, there's gratitude for the what's been cited, there's just a lot of work to do. So. This plan funds to 2,308 seats, but the sort of implied identified unmet need from the prior plan is 5,331 seats, so we're still over 3,000 uh, unfunded, unsighted, implied seats even before we do you know, a next round of analysis. And as you know, we are in the thick of the work on the Gowanus rezoning, which is going to create, uh, I think, in all likelihood, thousands of new residential units, bringing in thousands of new kids and thousands of additional seat needs. So um, 
uh, I guess I would just, and we are having some conversations, but unfortunately the way our planning process often works, uh, there's sort of a waiting until the environmental impact statement comes to assess. I would just, um, what are we doing to make sure that we are going to meet both the, those 3,000 seats uh -huh. and the increase, the substantial increase that is likely to come from the Gowanus rezoning? Because we can't do a rezoning if we can't give confidence. Right to the families in the district that there are gonna be school seats for their kids. We completely agree with you, and I will say that on all these major rezonings, uh, we have a seat at the table with city planning and all of the other agencies to talk about school seat need. That's one of the very first and most important things that comes up in those discussions with the local elected officials and local uh, parent groups and so on. So we, we completely expect that the Gowanus rezoning will result in a school or multiple schools. It, it, we, we would have it, to say. It's definitely gonna need we'll to be multiple to schools because we uh, already need 3,000 seats we have, and we're gonna have well, several thousand that, more. So I'm, that'd be a big school otherwise. I'm specifically talking about the Gowanus rezoning, but we do know that. And we have done a great deal of work in District 15 as well as we've done in District 24. There are other districts within the city that have need as well. And so right now we are addressing all the needs across the city. Again, if the opportunity arises to site 3,000 seats within uh, you know, this capital plant, we will certainly do so in District 15, District 24, or any other overcrowded district. But right now we are addressing need throughout the city. We will never stop looking for seat need for, for seats in District 15, District 24, District 20, those major overcrowded districts we continue to work on. But we had to provide some seats in other districts as well. Well, I, I'm definitely not asking, please reallocate the money from the other districts to my district. And really, in some ways, and I'll just leave it here, this goes more to the planning issues that the council has been addressing in some ways than it does to the funding issues. I think our current process misses something it should achieve because what happens is city planning develops its plans uh, and only after the plans are developed and the zoning framework is released and everyone knows what the plans are and there's plans basically for all the sites and developers have decided what they're doing, do we then do an environmental impact statement? Do we then address, assess the seat need? And do we then try to mitigate it after the opportunity to bake it into the plan is gone? It, it is not the right way to proceed in this process. The plan that city planning develops should include building the schools into the rezoning. And that would mean working with you guys before the EIS is out and front loading the school planning into the planning process more than has happened on any of the rezoning so far. We're making a little bit of progress on Gowanus on that, which is why I'm up here pounding my <laughs> fist because I don't know how to get it done otherwise. But it is a systemic problem in the way that we're doing it. And that's not the subject of today's hearing. Obviously, we've had other conversations about planning, but this is a real opportunity that, that we should work hard to take more advantage of. I look forward to working with you on that issue. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, council member. And, you know, I would I would just agree that you know we we touched on the issue that the council worked very hard on on the planning to report. One of the areas that we really stressed was the issue of communication and coordination. It shouldn't require the negotiation skills or negotiation power of a local council member to push for a new school in their district. It it should just be kind of a uh, a natural observation of, on the part of city planners and government that we need to build a new school in a neighborhood that you're seeing. Kind of uh, a lot of growth, and um, and so I, I I think that historically there's just been things happening in piecemeal without adequate coordination. I mean the SEA I think has shown the capacity to eventually implement what's been negotiated or what's been, but I think the planning part, which I think is beyond SEA, uh, needs a lot of work, and I think that's the frustration of my colleagues. Um, I just want to just circle back to a couple of issues that have been raised here and just a couple more. Um, the mayor announced uh, the Universal Physical Education Initiative in June 2017 and identified 76 schools that would receive capital investment through phase one of the initiative. Um, how, are the, how are these 76 schools uh, identified? 
They were identified because um, a survey was done of every single school. And those schools that had absolutely no gym space and no opportunity to provide gym space within the building though, and, and had available space outside. Those were the first group that we identified as being ground up new, new gyms, okay? And we were in process, about 20 some odd uh, number of those are in process right now. There are others where in fact uh, nearby opportunity to lease space to create a gym. Others where in fact there was opportunity within the school building to create a gym. And so those were the, the first 76 that we were dealing with. Right, I, I would just note that uh, we recently had a hearing about physical education and PSAL and it's alarming that at over 200,000 of our students are not receiving adequate physical education, uh, which are which are mandated mandated by the, by the state. So these are not just small items. This is a this is a big deal. And also we know that from research, um, when our students and I would add all students, because historically phys ed has not been really accessible to every child, um, and uh, so we need to make sure that every child has opportunity to be involved. In, in, that, uh, in that class, but um, there were a lot of varying reasons why we're not in compliance, and I was not pleased with the DOE's answers at that hearing, and I made that very much known. But I just want to hear from from the from your perspective, um, why do you believe we are not in compliance with these mandated state regs to provide adequate physical education? I, is it an issue of capital and construction? What what is holding us back? Uh, so, I believe Deputy Chancellor Robinson answered the questions around the programmatic aspects of this. Obviously, the space challenges of this are, are a challenge that we took on in 2017 and have been making steady progress on. Um, and of course, it's those two coming together where, we'll, where we see progress. And the DOE has made progress overall on the issue over the last several years um, since the mayor made this a priority, both on the programmatic end with PE works and on the capital end with PE for all. Okay, I, I would just stress that this, it's, it's more than just phys ed. Um, this is obviously being in compliance, but also we know it's, this is good for children and good for their learning. And, and, and so I think this is a sig significant issue. Um, and I know progress has been made, but over 200,000 students are still not receiving adequate PA time. That's one fifth of our student population. That that's very significant, um, and it seems to be pocketed in certain parts of our city as well. So I'd like to follow up with with, with both of you on, on that matter. Uh, and a question for the SCA: When the site of a new school is not extremely limited in terms of size, how does SCA determine what kind of physical education spaces to build? For example. How does the SA determine if, if the design for a new school will include a dance class, weight room, pool, or other physical education space that is not a basic gymnasium? Again, as, we, as, as you mentioned, uh, when the site is adequate, and, and it, it depends on a number of things. It depends on the size of the site. It depends upon the grade level of that particular school. It depends upon, um, you know, a, a, Typically in a new school, a gym is required, um, you know, cafeteria is required, dance and other, other types of programs. I, if I'm not mistaken, depending upon the size, we would have, for example, in a high school, we would have a full-size gym, a competition gym, and then we would have a practice gym as well. You might have an exercise room and or a dance room, depending upon the, the, the principal or the superintendent with, you know, from that particular district to talk about that. Um, I don't think that the SCA has built a school with a pool in quite a long time, probably a decade, two decades. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, space is not available. It's extraordinarily expensive, and it's expensive to maintain, and it's expensive to hire teachers who can teach swimming and the, and the like. All right. Well, I, I was fortunate to work yeah. in a school that did I have know. a pool. I know. And uh, and I will say that uh, this was during the last administration. We were able to connect the former mayor's his his administration was going to Europe 
to look for lifeguards to work in our beaches because they couldn't have enough lifeguards. When we had so many amazing students in our schools that were in, in, in swimming class, and we got them, uh, Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh, who's still in the Parks Department, yep. came down to my school and we said, hey, you have a pool here? I said, yeah. And they trained the kids and our kids actually worked. So that's, right. but I, I do think that we should be building more of these great things for, for, for our students. And I understand that space remains a challenge. I, I have, just to move to another quick topic, um, does SEA have any role in the remediation of when there's high levels of lead are found in water in schools? We did, um, we did the testing of each and every one of those uh, outlets um, initially, and the remediation has been really done by Division of School Facilities. So to this point, SCA does not? Really we have not done the remediation for that. Um, DOE's, uh, I know, expense budget currently risks, uh, includes, I'm sorry, $3 million annually for custodial staff to flush the water in school buildings to minimize the risk of lead buildup. Are there any plans for capital projects to completely replace pipes that result in wet buildup? Uh, so I will ask John Shea to jump in as needed, but uh, the water in New York City Public Schools is of the highest quality, and at this point, every cooking and drinking fixture that's online in schools is testing within state standards. So we have robust protocols in place in terms of testing. We're in the process of retesting. Um, Whenever there's an elevator result, we immediately take that fixture offline if it is a water fountain. If it is an essential hand washing sink, we place warning signs and we have robust protocols in place around notifying families as well. Um, and John, you can jump in with where we are in the remediation process. I believe we are very, very close to. Sure. So complete. I'll just reiterate that uh, the water in our schools is completely safe to drink. Uh, the testing and the remediation protocol that we have in place, we feel very comfortable that that will remain for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. We have not seen the need to refer any Is pipes. your microphone on, by the way? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we have not seen a need to refer any uh, projects to the SCA for lead remediation uh, for, for lead in the water. So uh, the testing, we are complete for the 16-17 cycle. We are in the middle of our testing cycle for uh, 2018. We actually should be done by the end of next week for, for this year, and then we'll, we'll continue on next year. Right. I mean, I, I will note that there, has, there have been schools that I will note that when you, when you find the lead, you'll shut the water fountain off, it'll be out of commission. Uh, but I, I've heard that there are some schools that will get accommodations by the DOE to get water coolers or, or tanks. Is that ac across the board or if that's just upon the request of, of that individual school? Yeah. So if there is a building where we have uh, a high number of drinking fountains, let's say, that test high for lead and we have to shut those off, we will provide bottled water for that school so that they have drinking water. Uh, but once those fixtures are remediated, tested and cleared, we put those back on and we take the bottled water out. So we just work with the schools based on their test results and where they are in the remediation protocol to make sure that they have uh, adequate water supply. Um, actually, and I have a DSF question, so, <laughs> uh, well, SCA and DSF, uh, uh, how do DS, SCA and DSF communicate and collaborate? Uh, if facilities, <laughs> problems, this is collaboration, I never assume anything. <laughs> I've learned that already very quickly in government. Um, if a facilities problem is flagged for DSF that falls under SCA's purview, how does DSF ensure the, pro the problem is addressed by SCA and vice versa? Uh, sure, I'll start. So uh, we have a well-worn path between Vernon Boulevard and 3030 Thompson. Uh, we're constantly uh, back and forth with the SEA, but on, on a specific situation, uh, we communicate uh, directly with the, the, the project managers and the senior project officers with the SEA if there's a school-specific issue. Uh, we have a referral process if there's something that uh, is an emergency that we need to refer to the SEA. There is a protocol that we follow. They are excellent to work with. They are always responsive. Uh, we communicate all day every day on, on these kinds of things yeah. right I, I would just you know point out this happened um, about a year ago so it's not recent but I I will say that when I flagged it for folks they did respond but there was a school in southern Brooklyn where the wheelchair lift was not operating and I think the folks did not know you know they they might have contacted you know SCA or this but it was under the purview of DSF um, and unfortunately, it took about almost a year for that to get rectified. And, and they didn't tell the local leaders until I found out about it much later. 
so it, it did raise a concern about if someone from DSF is contacted or SCA, just making sure that it gets connected and we, we cross the wires because I think there is sometimes confusion on this issue. What's a DSF issue? Uh. What's an S? I, I'd love a Venn diagram or some sort of a T-chart on this uh -huh. uh, because sometimes even elected officials want to check in. Is it DSF? Is it SCA? Mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about this. Sure. Um, and so this is, I think, just making sure collaboration is always happening, communication. I think that's, I just, I just want to re really stress that. Um, one item that we heard, uh, there was a big hearing recently, but I just want to focus on the, on the school aspect of this. Uh, the DOE will soon be losing office space in Long Island City. How does SCA and DOE plan to site and construct new office space? <laughs> we are wor actively working on that question every day. Um, so we have been uh, looking at what the space needs are of each of the offices that are at that location and what the options are, and we're moving very quickly. We have a, an SEA DOE task force on it. Uh, you saw the smiles because it's a regular topic of conversation, and we're already making some good progress. Yes. Uh, yes, I just, I, I'll ask quickly follow up and then my, my co-chair will ask a follow up is that, yes, I, I, I'm aware. Um, we just want to make sure that there's no disruption to key operational services because I believe what's housed in, in, in this office space is also OPT, if that's correct. Yes. And OPT is, is the subject of many conversations these days um, and there's a lot of follow up work that, that, that has to happen. and so. I think uh, we're, we're, our concern is just the, the operational aspect, mm -hmm. making sure that nothing disrupts the service to our students and, and our children. Um, and this probably should have been thought out during the beginning stages of, of entering this Amazon contest. But I, I just really want to just make sure that there's no disruption to our kids. And we will be monitoring this situation to, to ensure that. And my co-chair, uh, Chair Drum, has a question on just that. Just along that same note, um, I think that uh, you've generously given uh, an organization called Power of My Learning space in that facility as well. I think they have about 7,000 square feet there. They're also going to lose their home, and they are currently looking for space. Yes. Uh, it would be really a shame if we, if we lose that program because they um, reconstruct, use computers, mm -hmm. go into schools, and then give those computers away in the most poor parts of districts, uh, and it's an excellent program. So I hope that some provision will be made somehow that we can work together to find them either space or, or have them move along with us or whatever's going to happen there. I just wanted to raise that concern as well. Yes, we have, we are, that's actively part of our long list of uh, items we have to plan for. We've actually discussed the need to take into account that program and the wonderful work it does for schools. But thank you for raising it because it is important. Yes, I think the council member, well, the chair has uh, something to say, and I think Councilman Barron has been patient. Well, let, let Councilman Barron go. I have a, a, a <laughs> statement in words. Thank you yeah. to the chairs. Just one comment. Uh, chair Traeger asked about pools, swimming pools, and I, I think I heard you say we don't build swimming pools anymore. I just want to put on the record that the East New York Family Academy High School that will be constructed in 2021 will have a pool. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that the Correct. Act. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to get that on the record. And I think it's very important that where schools do have pools that they find a way to utilize them. The principal, uh, Mr. Yard, at that high school went the extra mile to do the programming to get a certified swim teacher and to provide that during the course of the school day so that his children could have that instruction. At another location, which we won't name, uh, four high schools were stumbling all over themselves and couldn't get a dedicated program to utilize the pool that's been there that my predecessor, uh, Charles Barron, had renovated at the cost of over a million dollars. And I had to use discretionary funds to pay an outside agency to come in and conduct an after-school swim program, which in fact resulted in, I think, five children being certified as lifeguards. So we've got to find a way to upgrade those pools where they exist and to have the school fully utilize that beautiful resource. Understood. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you, thank you again. Uh, just have a few questions. I wanted to uh, keep my subcommittee hat on, and I wanted to ask about uh, cost control, um, because in all of the work that we do, obviously uh, with capacity, with growth, we also want to look at how we can manage, to a certain extent, uh, control of a lot of the costs of these projects. So I wanted to understand any changes that were implemented today uh, to reduce the cost of capacity projects. Um, as an example, modified designing standards standards or building materials or anything that SCA has done and continues to do to really reduce uh, costs? Yes. Um, thank you, Council Member, for that question. Uh, we have, actually. Um, about two years ago, um, we promoted someone to the Director of Cost Control. And his job is to uh, sit in on every design meeting and look at the materials that are chosen the designs that are done, and look at them because I believe that, it's my belief that design can be beautiful and functional without being outrageously expensive. And so things like products that come from Europe oftentimes are very beautiful, but equally beautiful products can come from the US. Um, it's something that's monitored because uh, generally we work with some of the best architects in, in the city and the state, but architects think differently than you and I. And oftentimes they will find the most extravagant product and his job, my director of cost control's job, is to review those decisions and to make sure that we are adhering to um, what, as I said, beautiful but functional and we have lowered our cost per square foot over the last two years significantly. Okay, so you indicated that with the new director of cost controls in place for about two years now, um, monitoring some of those savings, do you have an actual amount that you project that you have been saving? And also in terms of moving forward with, with regard to design and just the equipment itself, are these practices that you're keeping in place moving forward with school construction? Oh, absolutely. We have specifications, we have standards, and all of these changes are incorporated into our standards. But I will tell you this, I don't have an overall number, but I will tell you that a couple of years ago we were bu building at about oh, $770 a square foot. Now we're down to 745 a square foot. So if you mul multiply that across the city by the thousands of square feet that we build, you will see that we have done a great job in reducing costs. Okay. Uh, does SCA uh, bid out each of the projects, the capital projects, individually, or are there a certain group batch of vendors that you work with that are responsible for several projects? Our projects, um, all of our contractors, all of our vendors are what we call pre-qualified. So they go through a process where they have to um, basically bring to us all of their background information, um, their ownership, um, whether or not they're certified MWBE. Um, I mean, there's a list of, of questions, integrity. Um, gosh, yeah, the, the list goes on. It's about a 40-page application. But once they're pre-qualified with the SCA, then they can bid on any project. Okay. And or, uh, let me qualify that. The vendors are then put into the categories that they um, belong in. For example, a plumbing company has a particular um, code that, that we use. They can bid on any plumbing okay. project okay. that comes along. And the, good, the great thing about that is in other capital agencies, they allow an open bid and then the contractor is qualified. So that can delay the award of a contract six months to a year, where we've done that up front. Okay. The proposed plan allocates about $8.8 .8 billion um, in terms of construction of new capacity. Um, any thoughts on design build authority ah. moving forward in terms of expediting projects, saving money? Moving forward. We would love design build authority. Uh, we made an effort uh, last year and we often go up to Albany and, and make that effort and we have not been able to get that opportunity. 
Okay, so I project that we're planning for the 2019 legislative session. Oh, of course we are. With our new Senate Majority Leader. Yes, we are. And our Assembly Speaker. Oh, Correct. Great, okay. I, uh, both my co-chairs and I, I mean, the City Council has been obviously very supportive of design build. We've been successful in the adopted budget and getting uh, design build authority on other agencies and large big projects, but um, we're not always, you know, getting it in terms of full gamut. Um, but I think the track record that SCA has is certainly to your advantage that it would certainly be highly considered in Albany uh, next you. year. Thank you. We would appreciate your help. So I think uh, Council Member Adams asked specifically about one of her projects in Southeast Queens with regard to scaffolding. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand how you track uh, projects that have scaffolds and the time frame in which they are you know, remaining in place and how does that work uh, if scaffold is up for a certain period of time that's not reasonable, how right. do you follow up with that? Right, well, um, typically, if there is no project in process and Division of School Facilities inspects a building and they find something that is of concern um, and they feel that there's uh, any kind of a possibility of a danger of a, of a, of a brick or, or some kind of something falling off the side of that building, they will immediately call the SEA and we will have our scaffolding contractor immediately as an emergency, erect scaffolding. Now, that's a situation where there's no planned project. So what would happen then would be that we, SCA, DSF, would ask the SEA to go have our architects and engineers look at the site, see what the issue is, if it requires a capital project. We would then, if it does, we would then go into design, okay? And that design could take a year and then we go through a, a bidding process. And so you will find that before any work would start, a year or two could pass because perhaps we don't have funding for that particular project and we have to move funding around in order to be able to, co to cover it. So there are a lot of variables here, but it initiates out of an abundance of caution. And that caution comes from the Division of School Facilities. And if they feel that there's a potential problem, they will call, we will run, we will erect scaffolding. Okay, great. Um, also wanted to ask about the relationship that you have with OMB uh -huh. um, in the creation of the proposed plan. What has been the conversations, the role that OMB plays, and how do you see that moving forward? You know, OMB does have oversight authority, and um, OMB has been uh, let's, let's, OMB has been tremendously cooperative. However, OMB asks all the right questions. Why are you doing this? How many schools? Where is it going to be? All of those questions, and we answer them, and believe me, our proposal was for $17 billion, and OMB authorized $17 billion. Okay. So in the same uh, vein of the conversation with OMB, um, as I understand, the City Council funded school capital projects in fiscal 2019. The certificates to proceed, the CPs, mm -hmm. uh, took a little longer than the typical time frame to be issued. Yeah. And the result on our end are a lot of our projects uh, have been delayed past the normal mm -hmm. time frame. And the notification to principals, as I understand, if it has not gone out yet, then it should be going out soon to all of our principals about schools that we're going to be funding. Do you know the reasoning behind this? Because this is not typical that this happens every single year. It, it's, it's not typical that it would be this late. However, right. um, typically we're talking about October is when the CPs, October, November, so this time it's up to December. The problem that happened in the past was that as soon as the budget passed, the letters went out to the schools. The money or the CP didn't get approved until October, November, and the schools would become very upset that they had to wait all of those months. So I think what's happened now is rather than putting that letter out right after the passage of the budget, we wait through the summer so that the schools are not so anxious waiting for that project to begin. 
So why is there a delay? I, I, you know, I can't answer that. You'd have to ask OMB on that. Well, I, I guess my only concern is I think principals that we've worked with through the years have been used to receiving those notifications yeah. right after the adopted. And, you know, I understand extenuating circumstances, unintended consequences. We do get that. Um, I don't want to be the practice moving forward that it's November, December. So I think it's best if, you know, we're not sure of what the delay is. We really should have a conversation with OMB because I think that there there is this, you know, notion that after the budget is passed, the notifications do go out, and they go out for a reason, yep. because a month or two later, you're notified by SCA. So I'd like to revisit that for the new fiscal year coming up, because we want to make sure that you know, schools are notified appropriately, and then we don't want to have any delays, as best we can avoid them. I would, I, I would absolutely think. love to do that, yes. Okay, so in terms of your staffing, uh, a lot of the work that the subcommittee has been doing with each agency to understand a lot of the internal mechanisms that really drive a lot of the work we do as it relates to project timelines, cost efficiencies, et cetera. Um, the operating budget, including your budgeted headcount, is that something that you would be able to provide the city council? Could you give us an understanding of what that looks like? Uh, yes, um, our operating budget right now is, is approximately $205 million. Um, and our head count at this point has been raised to 840. Okay. Do you typically have vacancies at the agency or is that the average? Uh, we, at this point, we, it was just recently raised, the head count was recently raised. So um, I believe we are somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 vacancies, that's it. Okay. And I think I, I bring that up because we all agree that, you know, agency resources are extremely important. Um, how we recruit and retain staff, uh, super important to make sure a lot of these projects are underway and they're moving forward. So I guess a, a larger question that I have, and it's been apparent with a lot of the council members, is in looking at the future of school construction and what a new school looks like. We call them enhancements, we call them necessities. Um, are we expecting and should we expect to see from the SCA, and you talk about designs, you talk about creativity, innovative projects, green roofs, I mean things of that nature, we should have the mindset that these <clears throat> amenities are necessities. Um, is that something in the design moving forward that we should automatically expect? Every school will have an auditorium, a gymnasium, a playground. Can we expect a green roof and things of that nature? Like what should we expect in this five-year plan moving forward as it relates to what school designs look like? Not so that we have to advocate and fight for it, but you already are thinking ahead of us before we mention it. We certainly um, would love to be able to put a green roof on every building. It's not feasible because it's not affordable. I will Can we tell make it you. Affordable? I will tell you that uh, on a new build, for example, if the school or the the district expresses an interest, or the elected official expresses an interest in putting in a green roof, we will design it in such a way that a green roof can fit on that school. We may not be able to build it with the new build, but eventually it can become a green roof. Um, there are a variety of things that individual council people, individual superintendents, individual principals, individual parent groups would like to see in their buildings. They don't always agree. And so we would like, if we're going to make major changes like that, we have to get agreement from all the parties involved. So oftentimes we're not gonna add something like a green roof if in fact it's not something that the school desires. It's not something that the parents want. They would rather have a dance studio or something of that nature. So again, it's, it's difficult where we can, we put these things in, but again, they are expensive. Okay, I appreciate that and, and certainly the willingness and talking about it moving forward. I would add that a very important component of the work we're doing here at the council, where you can get civic engagement from parents, from students, um, from many stakeholders, is participatory budgeting. Right. 
And I can tell you in the three years I've been in this program, most of my winning projects have been school projects, <laughs> science labs, gymnasiums, because parents and students rally together and they prioritize it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think one council member said it, but we also recognize that a lot of the funding, if we don't provide it, our schools are not necessarily going to get it in a certain time frame. I mean, it may be in a five-year capital, but it may not. It may have a five, it may not. Um, and so that's our struggle to make sure that we are looking at everything from the bigger picture as all being necessities that our children need. But I think participatory budgeting, not to put a plug into the program, but it's a really exciting, innovative way that you can get that support from all the stakeholders that you talk about when sometimes you feel there's a division. Um, and that's something that the city council has been a part of and we will continue to do so. Great. Terrific. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to our chairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I really have more of a statement than a question. I'm, I'm deeply concerned about um, how we're going to deal with this change in the identified seat need. Um, and I know uh, Councilmember Lander, you know, brought it up more. Um, but I think what we're dealing with here is, a, is an issue of identifying need versus determining how to address that need. And um, it, it's very, very concerning to me to see the, a reduction in 24 and, and, and I hear you saying that, um, you know, um, yeah, 20 percent of the need has been met. I think that was the number that you, that you used before. But 24 and, and some of the other ones, 20, 15, whatever, um, th they've traditionally never really caught up with themselves. And so um, by reducing that need, um, it, it's very, very concerning to me. So I think we're going to have to, you know, discuss this further. Um, and, and, and hash this out because I don't think we can just let that stand. Okay. Happy to. And just to kind of build on that, I mean, one of the things we, we uh, flagged with staff is that why will 50,000 of the 57,000 seats in the proposed plan not be built until 2024? Again, <clears throat> I would love to begin to build every single site that we find but now. But as, as the council member Drum uh, mentioned, District 24 is a perfect example. District 24 is a very overcrowded district and finding appropriate sites for those schools has been very difficult. We've been successful. We've certainly been successful, but it takes time. It takes search. It takes negotiation. Oftentimes it takes remediation. It takes design. It, first of all, it takes public review. There is oftentimes objection, believe it or not, to placing a school in an area. It takes a long time to get that approval. Once you get that approval, you need to design the building. Once you design the building, you have to bid out the project. And once you bid out the project, you have to construct it. So the process of our design and construction is fairly short uh, based upon what I know about other agencies around the, around the city. But it's not as much the design and construction as it is the stuff that comes before that, that can be extremely difficult and time consuming. I mean, I, I hear you and I, I don't dispute that I, I have heard cases where some folks might not like a school coming into a community. Which that's, that's, everyone has an opinion. Uh, but it, <laughs> but, but it, it does seem that there are, other, there are other parts of the city government that is able to get this done, like, namely EDC. I, you know, and, council and member, I, I'm going to argue that because at the last hearing we had, you said that uh, once before. Right. We have the best record in the city. 40,000 seats out of 44,000, 11,000 of those not given to us until midway through our capital plan. I would put that record against any other agency in the city, including EDC. Right, and I, I appreciate your, you know, your confidence in, in, your, um, in your work at SCA, President Grillo, but as, as we saw in, you know, in the case of even just, again, I'm not going into the merits right now, but I'm just talking about how they're able to find the space with, with Amazon. When they wanted to find it, they found it. And, and, and uh, I think that in we, 
prioritize education for our children in, in our city. And I just think that, uh, and I, I'm not disputing that the challenges that you face, but I think it requires leadership at the highest levels to say, we're gonna get this done and it will get done. I mean, also I have to just, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I, I hear you in District 24, but what's the, what's the excuse for District 20? Uh, one of the biggest overcrowded districts we have in New York City. Uh, there were 2,630 seats that we expected to see funded based on 2015-2019 plan, uh, but they're not proposed in the, in the new plan. And I, I, what's, what's the... And again, we have, District 20 is one of those districts that we have done extraordinary work, cited many, many schools, continue to cite schools in District 20. Um, and we will continue to cite schools. However, there is a limited number of funds and a lot of work to do. And there are other districts throughout this city where they have a need and we have not been able to fund them before. We need to do that as well. We have to be fair across the board. I, I agree, and, but I, again, I think this is the impact of educators in this role. We, you know, we talk here and there's a lot of heavy policy, technical stuff being discussed. My mind is in the classroom. My mind is knowing that we will offer our students better instruction if we work to reduce overcrowding, reduce class size, making sure that students have the full promise of a full school with, an, you know, with auditoriums, with gyms, cafeterias, air conditioned. <laughs> um, and, and so that's what's on our mind. So I, I hear you that you have stuff that you have to deal with and, and we appreciate your work, but that's what's on our mind. And, and I guess we're, we're just not gonna stop until it gets done. Um, and uh, the, the last thing I'll say is that we heard before about the, an Albany agenda. We're also preparing an Albany agenda. Um, and I think many of our interests here might align as far as the funding. Do you have an estimated cost of what would it take to make all of our schools fully accessible? We do not have an estimate for that. So many, we have many buildings that are as the Chancellor likes to say, we have a portfolio of historic buildings, <laughs> um, over 100 buildings that are over 100 years old. Um, and while beautiful, those designs were not at all designed with accessibility in mind. In fact, structurally quite the opposite. So what we are doing with this, again, significant investment of $750 million is seeking to move as many buildings as we can so that they are at least partially and in many cases fully accessible. Uh, and as I believe Chair Drum mentioned earlier, we have also changed the priorities uh, in admissions so that in the high school admission process, a student who has an accessibility need will receive priority um, for an accessible building if they list one. So we are really focused on how we can have the most impact for families. Our goal of getting one third of uh, schools to be fully accessible feels pretty ambitious to us, uh, and we don't anticipate that we'll stop the work when we get there, but this is, this feels like a, a pretty ambitious agenda for the next five years. There's no question, and I, uh -huh. I applaud the administration <coughs> for working with the council on this issue, and I uh, certainly think the money is significant. It would be helpful, though, if we can get back to follow up with us about a full estimate, uh, because when we head up to Albany and begin to lobby our law state lawmakers, these are the items that we need to, we need to specify. I think you and I have talked about this and I appreciate your advocacy and your great work on this too. We need to be specific with Albany. I think for years the advocacy has been sometimes too abstract. We need to be very specific yeah. about FSF, accessibility, dealing with these very, very serious issues in our school system. So I, I really do, do, do appreciate that. Um, and lastly, I think we mentioned uh, uh, te technology earlier on as well. I just want to stress that, and, and this might, I'm not sure where this, I think with, with, within, the, within the DOE, um, I know that there's been a big investment in trying to increase our capacity. It still remains a very pressing issue. Um, I like to visit schools as much as I can. We didn't fund smart boards that were supposed to be high tech for technology to be chart paper holders. Um, there are computer labs that have difficulty being turned on because of bandwidth issues. I'm not sure if we're even, even with the proposed funding that I, I, I'm reading, I'm not even sure if we're catching up 
to the demand of the bandwidth demand. So I, I just want to flag this because obviously we know it's good, it's good for teachers and students to have this as an option and to supplement their instruction. But I also want to stress, and I, I don't want to say I told you so three, four, or five years down the road, at some point we will be mandated to provide testing through computers. It's, I, I know yes. that's happening. It's, it's coming. We, <laughs> we are nowhere near ready. I know the mayor has an ambitious goal of computer science for all, and I applaud, I like having goals because it's something for us to work towards. We're not there yet either. Mm -hmm. But at some point, it will not be an option. It will not be just a, a press release. It's gonna be mandated. And I, I'm just very much concerned about this issue of technology. And so, but I, I, with that, uh, I do wanna also just say, President Grillo, uh, publicly, to thank, I, I know that you, you, you hold now two, two, big, <laughs> two big hats in city government. <laughs> Um, and I'll be honest, uh, initially I was just concerned about making sure that we're, <clears throat> you know, full steam ahead on both agencies, but I want to publicly commend your office, uh, your team, for being very, very incredibly responsive. I want to name Melanie and others. Uh, and, and, he, and, and I want to say this publicly because sometimes politicians will attack agencies at hearings in this. Your office has been incredibly responsive and helpful. I have a great team. I, I, I believe you do. I believe you do. I really th th do. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor Gomark, as well. Any f closing remarks from my colleagues? Here, here. <laughs> uh, also been joined by Councilmember King. We thank you for, for being here as well. Um, and with that, uh, we, we thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. going to eject the thumb drive. All right, uh, our next uh, panel that will call up, uh, Lainey Hameson from Class Size Matters, uh, Sarita Subramanian, uh, Kim Madden, and uh, Lori from uh, Good NYC. I think we could start with uh, Laney and then we'll work our way around. Okay, well thank you so much for allowing me to speak today and holding these important hearings. My name's Laney Hameson. I'm the Executive Director of Class Size Matters and I'm just gonna quickly summarize some of my testimony which is otherwise rather lengthy. Uh, I must say I'm very disappointed in this capital plan for many reasons. The first you mentioned recently, I don't, I'm no expert on every capital plan that's ever been introduced, but I don't think there's ever been one where so many of the seats have been backloaded so far. More than half of the seats won't be finished until after the five years are over. And 50,000, as you know, won't be completed until after 2024. And when that happens, we know that overcrowding is going to be even worse because uh, the school seats and, and school construction is lagging years and years behind development. And uh, Council Member Lander pointed out how the school planning process is broken. I know your staff has done a lot of work on this. And we really need to get to a better process. If not by city council legislation, we believe that it should be in the city charter. Um, because otherwise, we're going to just, you know, we'll be having these, these hearings for the next 20, 30 years. And things will be worse every time. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, 
The current plan did not meet its goals for school construction as, as the analysis of the IBO showed. They were supposed to have created about 62% uh, of their seats over the life of the program. Only 24% will be completed, only 11,000 seats over the five years of the plan. And I think if you compare that to the seat construction under uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who I, you know, fought with about this as well, it's a lot less. So this mayor does not have anything to be proud of in terms of the, the, um, the speed of this. Other problems that we met, we've mentioned gone through no identified seat need. You know, we've been working, and your council staff has been working to try to make that process more transparent. So they take it out of the plan for the first time since 2011. So that's really not progress. That's moving backwards. Um, we also um, sh show that uh, that you know we're disappointed that the, the the part of the plan for class size reduction has ba basically been slashed, and basically only the unmet um, um, construction of seats in the last plan, which shows that there is no. Um, actual goal of, by this administration to reduce class sizes ever, I believe. And it served as a fig leaf five years ago, and it's even less of a fig leaf now. Uh, there's, no, there's no category for replacement seats, which is a huge problem because we lose leases every year. Um, and then I just wanted to talk a little bit about this report, which we came out today, which is about the increase of overcrowding by the expansion of the pre-K and the three pre-K programs, which we believe are good programs. However, they should not lead to more overcrowding, um, which they have at 352 schools, which are already overcrowded, leading to worse conditions for almost a quarter of a million students. And at 76 elementary schools, it actually caused the school to go over 100%. And there's a lot of research now, including a randomized trial that was done, the largest randomized trial of pre-K ever done in Tennessee, which showed that these kids did not retain their, their gains in learning when they entered the higher grades. And one of the hypotheses put forward by the researchers and the lead authors of the report was that you need to put attention and into the quality of education of kids all the way through elementary school, especially K through three. And that has not been done in this administration. We have much larger classes in those grades. Uh, the new class size data came out showing, again, increases in class sizes in, in most of the grades across the city. So um, the overall focus and concentration on pre-K and 3K without any thought of how that's going to affect conditions in the other grades is something that cannot continue and should not continue. And I do believe that not only does there need to be a larger capital plan in terms of capacity, but there has to be a real focus on the part of this mayor to build those schools more efficiently. And as you know, development does happen quicker across the city than building schools, and it needs to be part of the planning process. It can't be an afterthought five or 10 years later. So thank you. And we have a nice little list at the, at the end of how many seats are going to be built every single year from the old plan and the new plan. And I couldn't have done any of this work without the IBO's help. So they've been invaluable, as have um, um, your staff. So I wanted to thank them very much because the analysis is very complex and hard to do. Thank you, Lainey. Thank you, Lainey. Uh, and, uh, Good afternoon, Chair Strager, uh, Drum, and Gibson, and thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's oversight hearing. My name is Sarita Subramanian, and I'm the supervising analyst for the education team at the New York City Independent Budget Office. The proposed new plan would increase overall capital spending to $17 billion, a 3% increase from uh, the current $16.5 billion, 25 to 2019 capital plan. The new plan would significantly increase funding in two key areas, new capacity and facility enhancements, the latter mainly to improve building accessibility and provide air conditioning. The capacity category would receive the largest overall increase, $2.3 billion, a 36% increase from the current five-year plan. The increase in funding for the capacity category is largely attributable to new capacity, which, will, uh, which, will, which uh, has increased by 64%, rising from $4.8 billion to $7.8 billion. Almost 57,000 new capacity seats are funded in the proposed plan, including 23,400 seats rolled over from the current plan, and 1,600 seats in two projects that are funded for design only. 
Over half of the new capacity seats, almost 33,000, in the new plan would come online for school years 2020-2021 through 2025-2026. The breakdown by community school districts is shown in the table attached to my testimony. In eight districts, all of the new capacity seats are expected to be completed no later than the start of the 25-26 school year. Uh, of these, five school districts had district level utilization rates for elementary, middle, and charter schools below 100% in the recently released 27-2018 uh, Blue Book. The utilization rates in the other three districts, 15, 24, and 27, were at or above 102.7%. On the other hand, no new capacity projects planned for school districts 19, 21, and 29 are estimated to come online before the 25-26 school year. Although capacity, capacity utilization was relatively low in districts 19 and 29, District 21 had a utilization rate of 104.9%. District 20 and District 25, the two districts with the highest utilization rates, over 121%, in 27, 2018, are expected to get the largest number of new capacity uh, elementary and middle school seats in the new capital plan. Together, these two districts account for one fifth of all new capacity seats. And by September 2025, more than two thirds of the new seats planned for District 20 are scheduled to come online, whereas only a little over one fifth of District 25 seats are expected to be ready by that time. The significant increase in new capacity is offset by decreased funding for other capacity programs. Uh, the new plan allocates $550 million for the Early Education Initiative. Uh, this is a 37% decrease from the $872 million allocated for Pre-K for All in the 2015-2019 plan. And funding for class size reduction also fell from $490 million down to $150 million, an almost 70% decline. Uh, and as Lainey mentioned, uh, the uh, funding for the facility replacement program has been removed entirely from this current plan. The new plan also shifts $180 million of funds to support the removal of TCUs from the capital investment category into the new capacity, uh, into the capacity category, and another $50 million remains in capital investment. Even combining these two categories, total funding for TCU removal would remain $165 million below what is allocated in the current plan, uh, likely because over 70% of original TCUs have already been removed. The proposed capital plan allocates $5.2 billion for capital investment, a decrease of 9% from the current plan. In addition to shifting some funding for the removal of TCUs out of this category, there are reductions in allocations for various exterior improvements and athletic field upgrades. Funding for the Universal Physical Education in Initiative would decrease uh, to $25 million. And this is also partly because the new plan um, includes funding just f through 2021 for that initiative. There are other areas uh, that would um, increase within capital improvement. Funding for facility enhancement would increase by over 71%. Much of the increase would go towards funding to improve accessibility, uh, which would increase by almost five times over the current plan. Air conditioning initiative would also increase almost fivefold. And spending on technology enhancements, which includes upgrading school wireless data networks, would rise 15%. This plan also doubles the amount spent on safety and security to $200 million, with a continued focus on installing video surveillance. Uh, and just to sum up, uh, finally, additional funding that was recently awarded uh, by the State Education Department for New York City's Smart Schools Bond Act application will likely change some of the allocations for projects in the capacity and capital improvement categories. Uh, in the city's approved application, $300 million would allow for TCU removal. $100 million would be dedicated to building or leasing new capacity for pre-K. And $383 million would allow for technology upgrades. Uh, to improve school connectivity and classroom technology. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hi, my name is Kim Madden, and I'm here to testify about school accessibility. Uh, I think the IDEA was passed, or in its initial form, about 50 years ago, and the ADA over 30. I'm not great with dates or math. If my son, Owen Atkins, was here, he could tell you both of those things. He's 15 years old, he uses a wheelchair, he has a neuromuscular disability. 
Uh, he can, he's really great at math, as I said. Unfortunately, he can't get into the vast majority of school spaces in the city. Something that I think is an inexcusable violation of his rights, and I'm so happy that the council has taken this issue up and that the city and the DOE seem to be finally moving on it. He's been in public schools since kindergarten. Uh, his first school was at Manhattan School for Children. It's a K through eight school, uh, actually in our neighborhood, which was amazing. If you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to visit it. It has an amazing community of inclusion. There's many students who travel from all over the city to go to this school who use walkers and wheelchairs and who are fully included in a district school. Uh, we were sad when we had to leave it, but it was time for him to go to high school. He's now at Lab High School for Collaborative Studies, where he's part of a very, very small pilot project. Uh, like all pilot projects, it's had some bumps. His first year was definitely bumpy. This is his second year. Uh, I think the teachers are learning to work with him. He loves being a part of a school community. He wore his bunny slippers yesterday for pajama day. He, he likes to be there. Uh, and I think that it's a place that has some work, but it's great to be there. One thing that made me sad is the principal said at a meeting last week, she can't expand the pilot program because they don't have space because of structural issues. It makes me sad, but she's not wrong. Uh, lab was upgraded recently from partially to fully accessible. Uh, I think the labels in this area are something to pay very, very close attention to. They seem to shift. Um, regardless of what they say, they mean very different things. So MSC was a partially accessible school. Lab is now called fully accessible. If you walk down the hallways with my son, you would see big differences, but not the way you would think. MSC has four very big working elevators. It has wide hallways. It has a big therapy room with windows and air. Uh, lab, conversely, has a non-ADA compliant elevator. His classmate who uses a motorized wheelchair can't back into it. She has to go in. She has to go in and then back out. She can't turn around in it. Uh, the hallways are very narrow. There's fire doors every, you know, in four different locations in the hallway. The classes are very, very crowded. This is a fully accessible school, uh, according to the DOE's new labels. Um, the therapy room is tiny, it's windowless, it's airless. It's, they actually, this was part of the pilot program where they turned a very small storage room into a therapy room, which is good. I mean, it's the reality of schools in New York City. But I just want to point out what this looks like to the students. When my son was on a high school tour, he was shown so many inaccessible buildings that were labeled partially or fully accessible. We were at front doors, or at not front doors, at side doors where there was a buzzer, but nobody answered it. We were at doors where there was no buzzer, and those are called, there's one where it's called a fully accessible school, but there's no actual way to get in. That's not accessible. He was shown so many bathrooms and told this is the accessible bathroom that were inaccessible. And that terrified him because he needs to be able to go to school and to be able to use the bathroom. Uh, it's something that I think, you know, at his current school, he's taught a lot of people. They now see it from his perspective and realize that's not an accessible bathroom. You can't get into it with a wheelchair. It has bars, but that doesn't make it accessible. I think that the more students like my son are included in schools, the more many people in this world will understand his perspective. And I want to thank the council for understanding his perspective. I think that it's important not just for students, but for parents, for teachers, for other members of the community who have accessible needs to be able to get into schools. So thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Strager, John and Gibson. I want to thank each of you for your leadership and commitment to equality for all students. Um, also, like to thank the corresponding subcommittees for having this joint hearing, and thank the entire council for their help with recognizing the need for more accessible schools and their advocacy for additional funding needed to make that happen. Uh, my name is Lori Podvesker, and I lead the policy work at Include NYC. And I'm also the parent of a 16-year-old with cerebral palsy who attends a District 75 program. We testify today to continue to highlight the urgent need for funding for accessible schools. The situations remain dire. In 28 of the city's 32 school districts, less than one-third of schools are fully accessible. And in seven districts, fewer than 10% are fully accessible. This is not acceptable. The $750 million in the proposed capital plan is crucial in improving the situation and must be preserved. 
Include NYC, formerly Resources for Children with Special Needs, has worked with hundreds of thousands of individuals since our founding 35 years ago, helping them navigate the special education service and support system so that young people with disabilities can be fully included in school. We commend the mayor and the New York City Department of Education on their efforts to improve school accessibility and recent policy changes and admission processes for students with physical disabilities. We urge the DOE in this capital plan to focus on full school accessibility for students rather than partial accessibility. As defined by the DOE, a partially accessible school can mean what it implies, that only part of a school is accessible to students, preventing them from fully being included in school life and all activities. Over the years, we have helped many young people who use wheelchairs or other mobility devices identify the limited school placements available to them due to the lack of accessible schools. One of our families tells a story of occupational therapy taking place in a bathroom and her son becoming despondent because he couldn't access the cafeteria to eat lunch with friends. We shouldn't be telling these stories in New York City. We strongly support the proposed funding in the 2020 to 2024 capital plan to improve school accessibility, and we urge you to ensure that the final plan includes at least $750 million doing this. We also want to ensure that the plan better supports individual schools in becoming fully accessible. The extent in which an entire school is physically accessible is crucial for inclusion, so students with mobility issues can equally access all activities in the same way as non-disabled students. Thank you for taking the time to consider this. I want to just thank the uh, entire panel. I just want to mention this before and I'll say it again. The advocacy, the powerful words in advocacy has made already an impact. Uh, and I, I, I definitely hear you and agree that uh, these federal laws and mandates were passed decades ago. But sometimes it's sad that you even need a law to make this happen. This is the right thing to do beyond, of course. And it just, it took a long time, but I think uh, with this council, and uh, again, I want to credit Speaker Johnson and my, my co-chairs, and our, we have a great budget team as well. We really pushed hard on this, and the administration is working. But I, as you heard during our exchange, there's more work to do. And so once we have an estimate of full accessibility, that's going to help make our advocacy much more targeted in Albany. Uh, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm all for yelling for more money, but I, I want to specify where that's going. And this is an area that we need, we need to prioritize. I want to thank, again, very powerful advocacy. Also thank the IBO, because you've been very helpful on this issue, and also on the issue of FSF, Fair Student Funding. Your numbers have been a good uh, fact check uh, on the administration, so I, I really want to thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you, Laney, for continuing the, the big fight for class size reduction. It's about the kids. It's, it's about the kids, and that's what we, as long as we focus on them, that's when we, we tend to deliver. So thank you. My, my co-chair, Chair Drum, has a question. Sure, thank you very much. And uh, I have a little story and a question as well. So I can really relate to the idea of, um, you know, the space issue. Um, and it seems to always really affect, at least in my experience, um, the um, special ed students. Um, and I remember sitting in a staff room at PS 199 in Sunnyside where I taught. And it wasn't even really a staff room to begin with. It was like, you know, staff closet, but I'm out of the closet now, so no, I'm not. <laughs> joke, joke. <laughs> but um, I remember sitting in the staff room and looking out, and sure enough, the maintenance guys came, they opened the maintenance closet, they took out the pitchfork, the rake, the shovel, the brooms, threw up a coat of paint, and turned it into a speech room. So there were no windows, and it was a little round table that could barely fit in there, and it was really just horrible. So um, that is a very familiar experience to me, thank you. And I just wanted to ask Laney, and maybe IBO also, um, you know, I mentioned that I was um, concerned about the, um, the issue of, of identified seat need. And to me, it seems to me, as I'm trying to think this through, that it's really an issue of equity as well, and uh, the communities that they choose to um, build new seats. I just wanted to get your opinion, and especially Laney, in terms of where we were going with that, with the identified seat need, and, and, and just get a feel from you. I was in the men's room, I don't know if you answered that in, as, when you started off or not, but anyway, just to get a feel from you on that issue. Well, I, you know, I, I don't think anybody in any neighborhood in New York City gets the education that they need, and, um, but certainly some districts, the, there are more funded seats compared to the need than others. Um, I think one of the huge, there are huge two, 
two huge problems that could be addressed because New York City is a growing city, because companies want to come here, because real estate uh, developers want to build house housing here. We are missing such a huge opportunity to build schools along with that housing that we are giving up every single day of the week, every single month, every single year, and it's just, it's, it's just appalling to me I mean, in some cities which are shrinking, which are losing revenue, which no one wants to move to, it's much harder to make sure that there are new schools built. But here, we could do it if there was any political will whatsoever, and there just doesn't seem to be the will. The other, the other issue has to do with identified seats need. We will never get what we need if the DOE and the SEA don't admit what we need. And I have been at countless hearings over the last 10 years where um, you know the question has been asked to Lorraine Grillo and before, and sometimes Kathleen Grimm, what, how much money would you really need to do the repairs you need, to have the seats you need, to ha have accessibility, though that wasn't necessarily a, a, for, a, you know, a foremost issue at that particular hearing, and they refused to say. And what Kathleen Grimm used to say is, we just don't have the money, so there's no point in telling you. Right? And so that's the one way in which they can pretend year after year that they're nearly meeting the need. And it was a great innovation when they finally had added that identified seats needs, even though we thought that it wasn't transparent and we couldn't replicate their, their numbers and it was a big underestimate. But to take it out completely is a huge problem. And it really shows that they have they, they want to hide the problem. They know the city is growing. They know that there are going to be a million more inhabitants. They know there are going to be many, many more students. The problems in Queens are totally out of sight. So Queens is the most shafted district traditionally, though earlier Bronx was the most underfunded in terms of percentages. And now Brooklyn is growing fast, and it's you know going to be totally shafted as well. Um, I just. I just wish that we had some honesty here, and I wish we had some real progressive, innovative thinking. Uh, the way they do in, in some states other outside New York, they do have impact fees in California, in Florida, and Texas. It may not fully need, meet the need for seats, but developers do have responsibilities to create infrastructure in schools along with new development. And I think in this city where you know everybody wants to live here, everybody wants to build you know expensive apartments or whatever, there really is an opportunity, a golden opportunity that we're losing because there isn't the progressive, inventive kind of thinking that needs to happen. Happen. And instead, as, as Council Member Lander says, the development plans go through, and maybe they throw in one school or, or two schools, and then those schools don't get built for another 10 or 15 years, and then there's, it's, we're even further behind than before. And, and, and the, 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 it's, it's not that complicated intellectually to understand, but it seems incredibly complicated politically to achieve. So I really wish you guys would put your mind to how we're going to solve this problem so that in five years or four years or 10 years from now, we're still not making the same points over and over again. Yeah, and I would just like, to, oh, sorry. I was just like to say, uh, you know, what um, I highlighted in uh, my testimony were these eight districts that are, you know, what we would consider front loaded. And in the plan, they're supposed to get all of their seats before, you know, on or before the 2025 2026 school year. Um, five of them uh, have current utilization rates below 100%. Uh, three of them um, do have utilization rates greater than that, but that is um, something to be said. For, there's something to be said for that, that utilization rates uh, take into account existing need or past need, really, uh, without even taking into account future need. Um, District 20 was another one that I've highlighted, is one that, uh, as Chair uh, Traeger has mentioned, um, has traditionally been trying to catch up, catch up in District 20, um, and they're not even able to catch up, let alone um, to keep, take into account the growing uh, enrollment that's projected for District 20, um, as well as other districts in um, Queens. So uh, I think there is definitely a lot to that, a lot that needs to be done in terms of, and that's something that we're going to continue to keep an eye on, um, how um, seats are uh, paired with some of the development projects that are going on in the city and to really try to understand how well they are able to predict enrollment, whether that's adequate for the development projects that have come online in the past. Just one more point about the Amazon deal because it's in everybody's mind. So not only are they giving a big DOE owned building to Amazon, which by the way, the community has been arguing for about five years should be turned into schools 
and a community center. But they're also giving to Amazon the one site they had for a middle school. And so Amazon is going to have to find another site elsewhere in Long Island City, which is going to delay that middle school for years. And that was a middle school that was already promised to the community and already in the capital plan. So all this nonsense about Amazon taking over, you know, building a new school, actually we're losing one school, one site that could have been many schools, and another site which was supposed to be a school, which we are also losing. So we're moving backwards in Long Island City, not forwards. And I think that that is exempl exemplifies some of the the, the 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 poor priorities of this administration in terms of, you know, housing development, economic development, and pre-K are the the main things they're focused on. And in terms of K-12, it just isn't there. It just isn't there. Uh, you can ask your character. What district is Amazon in? 30. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the, the other point I was making in my exchange was that, um, and again, I, I do want to say for the record that I have found President Grill to be, if, if I have a question, they'll get back to me. And I do appreciate it because some folks do not get back in timely manners. But um, the point is I was making was that when they wanted to get this done, they got it done. And that tells me as a policymaker, and that tells me as a, also as a resident of New York City, that those are the, sometimes the priorities over other things. And uh, I, I represent uh, in my council district, mostly District 21, but I do have a, a, a piece of District 20, which is one of the most overcrowded districts in, in New York City. And from, from our point of view, when a developer wants to build condos, they always seem to find space for that. When they want to build market luxury housing, they find space for that. But when it comes to a pressing need for, for schools, there's always, there's always an excuse. Um, and there were decisions made in our area when the DOE, this happened in past years, I can't blame the current administration, but I did ask them to get it back. They gave a beautiful school building in Southern Brooklyn over to the MTA. A gorgeous building in the middle of an overcrowded school district to, to the MTA. I asked them to, to get it back. I have, we have not heard uh, an, an update to that. Uh, so I, I completely agree. And in your point about they build other things first before a school, that happened in Coney Island too. There was a 2009 rezoning. They built the aquarium, which uh, the, the Shark Tank uh, Ocean Wonders, which is beautiful. They built the YMCA, which is beautiful. They're building housing, which I, of course, you know, for, for, uh, for folks who need housing, and I support. There was a point of agreement or, or, or agreement in the side deals for a school. I had to remind them of that. That has not happened yet. So you're absolutely correct. Uh, I agree with you that, and this requires better planning and execution on all parts of them. But again, I, I want to just thank everyone here for your great work, and there's a lot of, a lot of follow-up work to do. Uh, that's, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Final panel, uh, Maggie Murrow, April Coughlin, uh, Jackie uh, Kin, uh, Barney, I believe, and uh, Rebecca Kostichenko. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, before I even start speaking, I also want to thank you for all the work that the council has done to put the issue of school accessibility in the forefront these days. It's, re it's, it's, it's wonderful to have you guys as partners. Um, I am Maggie Moroff. I work as the Special Education Policy Coordinator at Advocates for Children. I also coordinate the Arise Coalition. I'm speaking here today on behalf of Advocates for Children. I'm not going to read you my testimony. I'm going to shortcut it. I'm not going to read you the example. I'm going to let all the parents here speak um, and get, share their experiences. But I do want to share some, some more policy wonky type stuff. Um, so. I, Advocates for Children has been around for over 45 years. We work to support um, New York City's most vulnerable children, working on behalf, 
in particular of low-income students. Um, we are here today to speak in support of the proposal for the $750 million to improve school accessibility. Not a surprise. Um, with our partners, many at the table today, including, by the way, I have to say Jackie Oak and Barney, who heads up Pi, and it was Pi who did that video. I wish we could have taken credit for it, but it was Jackie's. Um, so with all of our partners here and on the last panel, we called for a major investment in school accessibility, and we really are so grateful that the administration has heard us. Um, as the city works to develop this next capital plan, we do want to emphasize just how urgency, urgently needed that, proposing, that proposed funding is. So we released a data brief this fall, which I believe everybody has seen. Um, there we found sort of our key finding in that was that less than 20% of the city's schools are fully accessible. Um, it's really crucial that in the final plan that that money proposed at least be there. Um, but we do want to recommend a little bit of fine tuning to the description that's in the plan. The language now focuses on increasing partial accessibility and underemphasizes bringing us to full accessibility. Um, We've already talked with some of the key DOE staff, including Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, who was here before, and they have indicated uh, that they're open to changing that language, but we're seeking your assistance in, in, in pushing for that. Um, we want to recognize um, what a little, there's been a little bit of discussion about it also, but the DOE's recent announcement about their changes to the admissions process for middle and high school students. So that paired with the fiscal year 2019, 2020, and 2021 funding, and with the proposed funding now for the capital plan is gonna make a significant difference. Um, we really just are here today to say that we hope that the council will work, to continue to work to ensure that the final plan includes this funding, um, and we trust that the final language will be a little bit um, more forceful and more ambitious than what's there right now because all of our goal looking forward has to be not just partial accessibility, but full accessibility for every student, every parent, every community member who needs physical access, not to some, but to all of our schools. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie Imani. I'm Jackie Imani. I work out in physical education, work with parents, advocates, and and educators who work to um, ensure more inclusive opportunities in the city. In the city, we are extremely grateful for all the work the city council has done on the issue of school accessibility. You really play a key role in moving the issue to the forefront, and we can't thank you enough for all you've done and the major, major um improvement from the DOE and from the city and we are so excited and we applaud all that has done and we also of course support and, and urge you to support the $750 million proposal on the open. I'm here today to ask you to, in your efforts in supporting is to go oh, is to go watch the video that the member Trump referred to earlier. Honestly, we made the video for the leaders to see and to see how hard it is for real students and how it affects them. And so difficult for students to get here and talk to themselves. And our, all, our primary goal was for student voices to be heard by seniors that even, they even took, took the time to thank all of you and, th and the thanks, and the thanks seniors at the end of the day for all that you've done. I could say and tell you their stories, but they were so eloquent and they were so passionate that I could not do them justice. Rebecca's daughter is in the video as well as four other students. It's only seven minutes long. It's only seven minutes long. It is unbelievable. I, I had this idea. I never would have thought it would be as 
as as powerful as it as it became. So please watch the video to, to hear directly from the students how they feel about this issue. Issue and and of and continue to support the issue as we all, all do. I'm actually going to be done before my time up, but that's really what I can hear say I have to go, is to go listen to, to the students themse themselves. Thank you so much for all you've done. My name is April Coglin, and I'm a professor in the School of Education at SUNY New Paltz. I would like to begin by saying how encouraged I am by the $750 million proposal. And I'd also like to say that this is a great start. Before earning my PhD, I taught in New York City public schools for six years. But as a teacher who uses a wheelchair, when I applied to teach in New York City, I had no idea that I couldn't even get into or around most of the buildings. School buildings, school buildings that are not accessible or are only partially accessible do not allow students with physical disabilities to learn in them teachers with disabilities to teach in them, administrators with disabilities to lead them, and parents with disabilities to access them. As a teacher and wheelchair user, I have seen the many injustices related to lack of access and inclusion of students and teachers with physical disabilities, the defining moment when I realized the grave situation of inaccessibility and exclusion in New York City public schools when it was, was when I was waiting for the elevator to my classroom located on the third floor of the building at the school that I worked at in Washington Heights. The elevator was broken and as a result, I had to conduct my English class outside on the baseball field. But what bothered me more than teaching English on a baseball field was something I witnessed in the basement of the school and ultimately led to my pursuing a PhD and became the main focus of my research. I watched a group of students who used wheelchairs and other mobility devices being ushered into a small separate room in the basement of the building uh, down the hall from the broken elevator. These students were brought to this separate room day after day until eventually the elevator was fixed several weeks later. I should pause here to say that this particular school building was categorized as accessible. But students and teachers with disabilities could not get to their classrooms because of a broken elevator. Therefore, it quickly became inaccessible. No one ever asked why these students were being segregated. No one seemed to be bothered by or care about the fact that these students were separated from their non-disabled peers and therefore forced to miss their regular classes for weeks at a time simply because of a broken elevator. It was at this point that I began pursuing a PhD and focused my research on interviewing New York City students with physical disabilities to learn about their experiences with physical, social, and academic access, or shall I say, inaccess. Now, as a college professor, part of my job responsibility includes supervising student teachers. I have already encountered inaccessible New York City school buildings that I am assigned to, but can't get into in order to do my job. I have also encountered accessible schools where individuals with disabilities are required to roll through back alleyways, past garbage dumpsters, through puddles of rotten milk, only to be met by a locked gate where you have to wait for someone to come and unlock it and escort you to the freight elevator. The freight elevator. Students and teachers with disabilities go through this every single day. Ironically, painted on the wall near the, the accessible pad locked entrance is a sign that reads, education is power. To this, I would like to add, only if you can get inside the building. And I have some photos. Okay, can you lend me that? Thank you. Some photos of, of that building. No school with an entrance like this one should be categorized as accessible or partially accessible. This is misleading and inaccurate. When evaluating buildings for accessibility and planning for increased access, it is absolutely essential for the voices of those with physical disabilities to be included in the conversation. As the disability rights movement saying goes, nothing about us without us. Yet oftentimes we are completely left out of the conversation about the very things that directly concern us, like physical access. Let's face it, a roll through is going to be much more effective in identifying barriers than a walk through when evaluating a building for physical access. Please utilize our expertise and contact us. I am personally volunteering right now and I will be happy to provide you with my contact information. Thank you. 
Hello. Um, first, I just want to say thank you very much to all of you. I know I'm not an unfamiliar face to those of you that are left. And um, to your staffs, to the whole council, if they were still here, I'd say thank you to the SCA. I would say, I'm saying thank you to the DOE. I think um, uh, I kind of wish I could just do a happy dance and hug you all about this proposed budget, um, but I won't because that would be embarrassing to myself. Um, uh, I will tell you that I actually wanted to ask for a billion dollars. <laughs> um, so I'll ask for that now. I was told that I'm allowed to ask for my own personal request and not our group request at the city council meeting. So I'm now asking, I'd actually like a billion dollars. Um, uh, so um, I think that's fitting for the years of need that we've seen unaddressed. Um, and I'm really glad that you asked for an actual number of what we need. I think um, one of the things I wanted to say today, and I'm not that organized today, I apologize for that now, um, is that to me one of the worst things that I've heard in the years that I've been advocating and finding things out is that we don't even know what the problem is because that's how little attention it's gotten that nobody even knows. Um, and now, thank you to the work of Pioneer Eyes. And the DOE is work, working hard with them now. I think we're going to have more data. And with you guys asking, I think we're going to know. Um, so I think a billion is probably going to seem like the right amount once we find out what it is. Um, I'm hoping that that could mean that this uh, amount would be repeated in every five-year capital budget. And hopefully, maybe in 50 years, we might get somewhere really uh, successfully at the end. Um, so uh, it's kind of appropriate as a parent. Uh, one thing you learn when you have a child with a disability that you clearly probably weren't expecting is um, you get to see some of the worst um, things in the world and discrimination and ignorance that you didn't expect to see. But the other thing is you get to um, see really wonderful things that you also didn't see and people that really care and that go um, above and beyond about things that have no personal benefit to them. And so, um, you know, thank you for being some of the angels that I see. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, it's been a really positive fall because of this announcement and the announcement about priority and admissions. It's also been really tough. Um, because we've been going through high school choice. <laughs> so um, I have to tell you my stories, even though I know that I've, I'm singing to the choir at this point. But I feel like that's what I'm here to do, is to put them on the record and have them be heard. Um, I passed up this page to you guys. I think you saw it. I think it speaks for itself. Um, we live in Brooklyn, 10 of um, 110 schools, or 11, excuse me, of 110 schools are fully accessible. And I put at the top here, when I was first looking through the book, I put ADA campus. It's not ADA. Don't ever think fully accessible is ADA, because it's not. So that's important to be aware of. Um, so that's been really tough, to have this big book and to tell my daughter that this is what she can get in Brooklyn from this big book. And to see her deal with it, um, I have seen, I think, 28 schools this fall. I cast my net far and wide because I was determined that this was not going to limit her. And wherever the school was in New York City, I was going to go. And even before the decision to uh, waive some priorities that work against kids with disabilities, I was going to fight to get her into wherever she needed to be. Um, and we went on a lot of tours. We went on tours where we stood waiting for doors to be opened, where we were left behind on those tours, where we saw fully accessible schools that had six floors, and the bathroom that was accessible was on one floor, and you had to get a lock key to get on the elevator to get to your class. To get that key to go back on the elevator, you had to get the key to the bathroom to use the accessible bathroom. I mean, those aren't architectural issues necessarily, like you could fix those, but um, we found a lot of people didn't even call us back when I would have to call everywhere and say, we're going to need an accessible tour. It was very difficult to get people to respond to those calls. And when I did, importantly, especially in the partially accessible schools, because we clearly had to look at them, um, the answer, I, the, the, the phone return messages or conversations I would have were telling because what they would say was they would sort of pause when I would say, well, you know, they would say, you know, we're partially accessible. I'd say, well, yes, yes, I do. 
and they would kind of their wheels would turn and and then they'd say well you know this is not really a good this is really going to be difficult for you like I'm not sure you really want your child to go to school here I heard that so many times I can't tell you because they really I think the people within the schools themselves think that there's some beautifully fully <laughs> accessible schools somewhere that just aren't available so the truth is that the partially accessible schools are not good enough and the people in them know that they're not good enough um, so we really need to be looking at full accessibility. I mean, that's what my daughter wanted. She wanted to apply to schools where she was going to go in the same door as everybody else, and she was going to have access to the stage and access to the music room and, and complete accessibility. Um, at the end of the day, her list, the top of her list, is a fully accessible school that does not have complete accessibility because she loves the school so much that she's choosing to deal with it, but she shouldn't have to, to make that choice. Um, and uh, I am going through my notes because my daughter's also been in the hospital a lot for good things. And I'm only saying that because I always feel like as a parent of someone with a disability speaking at these meetings, I should always remind you that these kids are going through a lot more than just what we're talking about. So you have to know that the impacts of what we're talking about are even bigger sometimes. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say that um, when it comes to partial accessibility, my daughter really wanted those things because she didn't have them in her middle school. And in applying to high schools, it makes me think very much about where would she want to go if she had been able to practice music in the music room for the last three years? And would she have wanted to go to LaGuardia or Frank Sinatra if she had been able to choose drama if the stage had been accessible? And then he, you know, she met April recently. She has a crazy crush on April. She's like the coolest thing she thinks on wheels ever. So um, I just think what would it have been like if my daughter had had a teacher like April, you know? Or if her friends had had a teacher like April, her peers had had a teacher like April. But it's, it's um, so uh, there's a million things I want to say. I never get through enough time. I'm not going to cry today. One more thing I wanted to say was that um, the statistics at the Department of Labor for kids with disabilities, or uh, people with disabilities, 16 to 64, no matter what level of education you attain, so even if you have graduate, like postgraduate degrees, are always double for people with disabilities than they are for any, any, anybody else. Um, and if you, inter if you make it intersectional and you're a woman or you're a person of color, Forget it, you're really done. So I just wanted to put that in here to remind us that these kids need good education. They need it. And um, they also need it in schools that have school wellness, culture, climate that accepts them and includes them and makes them expect that from the rest of the world. Because so many kids with disabilities in this city, the way they've been treated by their schools often are really happy with less than what they should be happy with. They, they, don't, they have very low expectations because of the way they've been told they should be expecting their life to go. So I just thank you. Thank you very much. Could I add one small thing? Because a number of us have referenced this. Um, we are using the DOE's own definitions of partial and full accessibility here. So I just wanted to make it a little bit clearer. So using the DOE's own language and definitions, um, what they use in those building accessibility profiles that they have been using to survey all of the schools, a partially accessible school can range from one where there's general access to at least some of the ground floor, but where there are no accessible bathrooms or classrooms, to a school where there's an elevator that goes to all of the floors, but, uh, and, and this is in quotes, certain public assembly areas or classrooms may not be accessible. So, um, you know, as, 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 as Kim testified, and as Rebecca testified, and as April just testified, partial accessibility means a lot of things, and our concern about depending on that is that, in effect, um, partial accessibility still doesn't allow students and family members and educators to access all the important parts of the building. So it really can't be the end goal. So, 
Well, I, I thank you for that because it, 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 this will require us to follow up with them to find out, you know, who do they rely on to make the judgment call that this is a partial full? And now we have to ask even question. I mean, when, when I'm hearing, and I, I, I believe I believe you, that when they label schools as fully accessible and they're still not, that makes no sense. I mean, that, that's crazy. And, and so we have to address that immediately because especially as we're finalizing these plans, and I could tell you that we will be advocating for more money on top of the 750 because we, we know this still, this is a big down payment, but it's just down, a down payment. Yeah. There's still more work to do. We need to make sure that it's, it's actually getting the job done. And so I, we have to check, and I made a note of that, so I, I will follow up on that. And, and they, should they should work with advocates and folks who know what they're doing to make, make these calls. I mean, that's common sense to me. Um, I have a, first, I want to thank all of you again. I, I want to just say that your remarks, and Rebecca, I just want to say like uh, some of the remarks that from the last budget that we had, they were in the room, in our budget room. Thank you. They were with us. Thank so you. don't let anyone ever tell you that advocacy doesn't work. It, you, you all have already made a tremendous difference uh, on behalf of your children, on behalf of all kids in our, in our school system. So I want to thank you for that and continue the advocacy. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question for the, for the professor. Just, I have a piece of legislation that's analyzing, because we, we've heard anecdotally that there are students that are sometimes encouraged or required to use separate entrances because of their let's say different abilities or they call mm -hmm. disabilities. Can you verify if, if, if you've heard the same as well, or if, if you've seen the same? That, I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure I have it clear what you said, so that students with? Students with disabilities are sometimes required to use separate entrances than the main entrance. Oh, of, absolutely, of school, all the building. time. Yes, absolutely, and, and teachers and parents. And teachers, <laughs> yes. And administrators, <laughs> um, yeah, I could, share many, many, many stories with you if you need them. Yeah, I, I, I'll make sure that my staff gets your contact information. She has a whole dissertation. Yeah, I have a whole dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> I basically left my job in New York City schools to um, work now on the outside to improve the accessibility within New York City schools. So um, this is my, my life goal here, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I cannot thank you enough and thank you for your service being an educator and. We have a lot more work to do clearly here. Uh, I don't know if my colleagues have any questions or comments, uh, Chair Drum. I, I want to apologize to Jacqueline because I didn't know it was your video. No worries. <laughs> no worries. But it was a great video. Well, it's getting around, so now you may, you may be up for an Academy Award or something there. <laughs> for the kids, that Yeah, it was great, really good. I urge everybody to watch it too. What? I urge everybody to watch it also. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Gibson. I also wanted to thank you as well, along with my chairs, because I want everyone to remember that in all of the work that we've done at the City Council and all of the great successes that you know we take credit for, we take it on behalf of you and your children. And remember that every movement that we've had in this society has really been led by people not politicians, I, know, I don't like that word, but not politicians, but really by people because they have recognized the fundamental inequities that existed from the beginning. Um, I think the money and you know, the allocations are great in what you know, Chair Traeger is talking about, but I think you know, where a lot of the differences lie with what we're doing versus what SCA and DOE are doing is the criteria. How do you define what accessible means? It's just like the word affordable. It doesn't apply to everyone, and I think sometimes the own criteria that the department uses is not what we define as fully accessible. So turning a supply closet into a room for speech pathology is not acceptable to us. There's no air, there are no windows. I mean, that's just not acceptable. But under their rules, sometimes it is acceptable. And I think that's where we have the impasse. And what I'm hoping we can do moving forward in you know, the next fiscal year is have these conversations around budget because that's important, but the general public doesn't understand. It's also the process by which we spend this money as well. Um, and so I thank you for being here. I thank you for your testimony, not on behalf of just yourself, but really for a lot of children 
children, a lot of parents that feel powerless and they feel voiceless. Um, you really are making an impact and based on all the great su success we've had, you are demonstrating that you know there is power in numbers. So I am grateful for you being here and your faces all look familiar. So that <laughs> means I've seen you before and I encourage you to keep coming because we have to keep talking about these issues and you're on the ground as we are and you see it. Um, I think we didn't talk about it at the beginning of the hearing, but we all talked about air conditioning. The first two weeks of this school year were horrible, horrible in terms of being in sweltering classrooms as if that's ever acceptable. And, you know, I experienced it myself on a personal level. One of my family members was dealing with it and came home yelling at me like, well, auntie, what are you <laughs> doing about it? And I had to have an answer. And so, you know, we hear this criticism from not just our advocates, but, you know, we hear it from our family members as well. So, you know, don't think we don't get criticized by our own family, too, because they also want to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. But uh, once again, really appreciate you being here at this hour and coming to us and working with us through this process. I mean, we are partners. We're learning learning together, we're learning a lot of the things that need to happen, and we're also making sure that we are committed to getting a lot of great things done. So I thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, and thank you for mentioning family. I mean, I have, uh, I'm a former teacher myself, but my father is a retired District 75 teacher, and my mother is a retired paraprofessional. Um, and so this is, education is very near and dear to our hearts. And uh, I had, trust me, all of your advocacy was in our room, but I had my dad's voice as well, saying you better get this done. Uh, but I know that we have a lot, a lot more work to do, and time is of the essence, because uh, time, time is, is of the essence. I mean, I, I, this is a civil rights crisis that our kids are experiencing, and, and we have to get this done, and there's money to get this done, and that's really the issue here. So there's money, but also we need to, as my colleague Chair Gibson mentioned, we, we need greater, we need more sharp definitions of accessibility. And, and that's where I like to work with the advocates and families on that mm -hmm. and not just rely on bureaucrats. We need a clear definition of what, what this means, what, what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it might require maybe some, some uh, touring of some school spaces as well for us to see firsthand too. I mean, I have some experience, but I think that your knowledge base is far greater than ours. Um, and so um, we will follow up on, on that matter as well. And yes. Just one quick thought on that. So one thing that we shared with the Department of Education um, is that those building accessibility profiles that they've been doing are pretty great. Um, and it was our suggestion to them that they lose the partial full accessibility terminology and they identify schools by their BAP numbers um, with a link to those numbers because that actually tells a family or a community member who's looking at a school a whole lot more about the school than than these broader terms. Right. So um, we can definitely talk more about that, but it, it doesn't replace somebody rolling through the school, as April said, but it's definitely a more informative start than the big sort of loose categories that they're using right. now. Right, and also I, I'm not gonna accept their excuse that some schools are just impossible. Look, I understand that some schools were built many, many, many years ago, very difficult. I, I visited a school uh, in Queens uh, recently, a District 75 school, where they don't believe that the school can sustain an elevator, for example. So I said, build a new school immediately. And why was the school even picked in the first place is beyond me, because mm -hmm. it's not accessible in so many other ways too. But let's build a new school. We have money in the budget, and again, if you could find space for Amazon, yeah. you could find space for our kids. Yeah. Bottom line, and, and that's it's an issue of prioritization in our city government. Can I, can I mention one thing about that? Yes. Um, one thing that's happening that we haven't talked to you about yet, um, but is relevant to this, is um, in seeking spaces for schools, the city is leasing a lot of buildings that are not accessible. And every time they do that, they create more inaccessible seats rather than less accessible seats. So, um, you know, I know that uh, right now in District 15, uh, we live in District 15, there's a lot of new spaces that are about to happen in District 15, and we are overcrowded, and I see it, and it affects disabled kids actually a lot when they're in an overcrowded school. Um, but uh, quite a few of those seats are not accessible, those brand new seats that are going into District 15. 
So I think that if we're looking for sites, we should be looking for sites that are accessible, and to the extent that they're not, if we have long-term leases, we should be making them accessible when we open those schools. Agreed. Again, common sense, but agreed, yes. Cool. Uh, any other comments for us? Again, we can't thank you all enough. Thank you. Onward, more, more work to do. You got, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch this video. Good. Thank you, thank you so much. And this hearing is officially adjourned.